Patients or health was the number one response there. Number two, I believe, obviously it's a gorgeous day out there today, but as we know, being a coastal community, there are weather conditions that do pop up from time to time, as well as some of the heat, extreme heat temperatures in the summer as well. The number third one there was, interestingly, do not feel safe in some of the areas of Southport. So real interesting comment there. And you can see the others there. The last one there at the bottom right talks about acceptable parking duration. We typically want to know how long most folks really need to park when they come into the downtown Southport area there. And the number one answer said that two hours was sufficient enough time. About half, almost a little less than half the respondents felt that that was a respectable amount of time. Three hours was the close second there. The supply and demand turnover. I feel like I'm blocking your view from here. Okay, great. This is a snapshot when we were actually able to record utilization and demand about that second week of June, assuming that most of kids would be out of school, family vacations would be underway, all of the activities surrounding Southport and Bald Head Island would sort of be in full swing at that point in time. This is what we refer to as our temperature heat map here. You'll see the extreme red areas there, and these lines represent the on-street parking in these various blocks of downtown. Red is meaning that it's greater than 85% occupied there, which we would consider to be problematic. The next one there is about 75% to 85%. That's that orange shaded color there. Yellow is a little more than half occupied, and the green areas there reflect virtually no demand or no activity, less than 50% activity. So I don't think it becomes any big surprise here. These two maps reflect Friday observations of the weekend that we were here. You see a lot of that red around the core area there of Howe and Moore Street, where a lot of your retail and dining options do exist on the left here. The 630 snapshot is interesting because you see that retail demand shift more towards the Yacht Basin area and, of course, north on Howe to more of the eating destinations there, as well as that 100 block of East Moore Street there. Clicking over to Saturday, the next day, very similar observations there. That Saturday, 10 a.m., when a lot of the small business retail stores open up, you're looking at 100 South, 100 North Howe Street, as well as 100 East and West Moore Street. Very heavy populated um, from, a, from a user uh, demographic. It's also interesting to notice that uh, on, on South Caswell there, uh, the, the particular area there, we believe that a lot of that may have been service level employees that are actually um, arriving on site before the Yacht Basin restaurants open up. That's where they tend to park, or at least that's what we perceived is where they were parking. You shift over to that 230 graphic on the right here. Again, you kind of post midday meal period there. You see some of the retail air activity still uh, in full demand there, but you can now start to see some of that dissipation uh, in the downtown area there with a greater focus towards more of the, the uh, dining uh, destinations there. And then the last one really does a comparison here of that 230 count on the left and that 630 count on the right. Again, no big surprise there watching the, the retail demographic shift towards more of the evening dining um, demand areas there. So pretty telling there. It's also, I think it's good to know that if you, you know, briefly look up there on areas of Nash and, and portions of the 200 block of Howe Street there, you do see some availability from time throughout the day, especially as you kind of really go more east of Howe Street there over to Davis and Dry Street and eventually over to Atlantic there. I know you vastly get into some of the residential areas over there, but it's interesting to see that some of that inventory is certainly still available throughout the day. Um, these next two graphics here on the left, um, when we do our parking turnover analysis, we look, we record license plates of vehicles that are parked in the on-street spaces. Um, and, and so what we found is that some of these license plates would appear at multiple times throughout the day in the exact same space. And that, of course, tells us that there's a bit of a challenge with turnover in some of these areas. So you can see kind of the darker orange um, bubbles there. That's where we really noticed a lot of the same vehicles not turning over. It steps back a little bit when you talk about the, um, the slightly less red orange there. I guess that would be a, a more softer shade of orange there. 
but it, it does let you know that you do have challenges with folks wanting to park in spaces for multiple periods of the day. And remind, and let me remind you too, we, we started that first count at 10 a.m., so in a lot of these areas we still saw the same car parked there at 2.30 after, in the afternoon, and then in some case that car may have still been parked there at 6.30 in the evening, depending on it, who, who it may have been. So, oh, okay. <laughs> Um, so as we look into the recommendation on the right there, um, we do not believe that a paid parking solution is necessary for Southport. We don't think you're there just yet, but we are curious uh, to discuss our recommendation of a turnover program, such as a two or three hour time limit program. And that's what's reflected by the red areas on the streets, on the graphic on the right. The green area would be more that unregulated area where um, folks could park as long as they wanted to. But certainly in the prime areas there, uh, shown in the red, is where we think that this, the city should consider a, a duration parking program. Move over to the additional inventory needs here. I realize some of these might be difficult to see there. but. I found it interesting. I did spend the weekend here uh, and, and did get to see the boat show activity and the holidays activity as well. And a lot of where folks were parking were certainly in a lot of these areas where we think that additional formalized parking could be added, especially as you start to go north on Howe Street uh, to cross over many of the, the east-west roadways there. And if you are talking about adding more of these enhanced crosswalk areas crossing over Howe Street there, that's going to effectively eliminate parking on Howe with this idea of creating more formalized parking on your east-west streets there. This graphic on the left is 100 west and 100 um, west, um, or, I'm sorry, 100 west George and 100 west Brown Street on the left there. Um, there's been some talk about is there enough parking inventory at the, at the recreational parks there. This one on the right talks about the Taylor Field and North Rett Street area there. Uh, there is an opportunity to add more of the perpendicular parking there in the right ways on either side of the Taylor Field entrance there to add inventory there. Uh, the other one here is the, um, uh, the Memorial Park up um, uh, uh, to the west there. This one in particular, all it really is doing is formalizing more of the perpendicular parking in front of the park entrance there. I believe in some cases folks may be parallel parking there, but giving it a more formalized approach would encourage more people to utilize that space when patronizing the park. We did a kind of a, an interim study here in the middle of this process. I believe the Kingsley Park uh, was a focus area several months back, um, and so one of the things we were asked to do was to review this idea of adding parking along Bay Street there just sort of west of the park in itself. I know there were some sightline concerns, some safety concerns of vehicles coming down Kingsley Street and making that turn onto East Bay. Uh, but after reviewing that, we felt that it was certainly appropriate that you could add some perpendicular parking there in front of the other development site, which is city controlled right away. So the city does control that area. Uh, the big question that came up often during this study was what about this uh, Bay Street side that's closest to the point where we are right now, this 300 East Bay Street there. Um, there was kind of a back and forth discussion about, um, you know, is it historical real estate there? Um, but of course there is city right away that we believe that exists along Bay Street there. So when you talk about this opportunity to add more parking, especially down here in the southern area of, of downtown, this particular um, kind of mock-up here on the left graphic shows that there is an opportunity that you could add more parallel parking there without necessarily compromising uh, much of the, the real estate there. Uh, on the right shows the one in 200 blocks of West Bay Street. Again, we saw a lot of folks parking in these areas this weekend already, and it makes logical sense to just more or less formalize that area for, for public parking opportunity. There's this question some folks may is it okay to park there today? You know, it, it certainly doesn't look as formal as it could look, but I think if you were able to make it a little more formal, I, I don't think that folks would have any questions with that. Um, we took a look at the water tower area there. Um, it's kind of a, obviously it's a, you know, historical landmark for the, for the town itself there. Um, 
a lot of what we would call kind of ad hoc parking that exists around the water tower there today. We understand that inventory is certainly needed to support the, uh, the businesses there um, by the water tower there. But from a safety perspective and from a, a you know, kind of a vegetation protection pr plan, if you will, a lot of folks parking in some of the, the green areas there, the unimproved areas there, parking on tree roots and things like that. We thought, and I realize that the, the graphic on the right there is kind of a little busy and a little difficult to see perhaps for some of you where you're, where you're looking at, but this idea of improving um, the spaces just kind of north of the water tower there along Brown Street, and then really looking at eliminating the parallel parking on Dry Street. Dry Street's very, very narrow as it stands today. I know there is no parking on the water tower side of Dry Street, but there's oftentimes folks parking on that kind of eastern side of Dry Street there, which, make that area, which makes that area very congested from time to time. Um, so some folks ask, well, if we take this parking way or mitigate it or reduce it, where does it go? And that's where this idea of pushing more parallel parking to the west side of Howe Street or in the 100 block of West Brown Street. Um, so, so that's a, the brief summary there for the water tower area. We also took a look, we're asked to take a look at the, uh, the gymnasium uh, parking over there on um, West Street. Um, it was brought to our attention. A lot of folks were, again, parking uh, in the center median there on busy gymnasium nights for open gym nights, I believe. And this idea of continuing kind of the, the bollards and chains to sort of protect that kind of grass right away area there. But then, of course, that would be pushing more folks to using the um, both sides of the 200 North Atlantic Avenue block there for more of that parking option. So it's just it's it's real troublesome, obviously, that section of West Street. It's a very beautiful section of West Street. Um, but once again, it's, you know, parking is not really designed necessarily for that portion of Southport. So really more or less formalizing that approach there would be the recommendation that we're making. All right, so this is the Yacht Basin District. This was, um, I understand this could be a potentially contentious discussion here, but I think from a very high level approach, um, we, we support this idea of again, promoting and creating and developing this overlay, parking overlay district to really more or less formalize parking there. I think we all know and recognize for those businesses to be successful, that parking is, is a vital part of, of the community there. This design is, to some of you, it probably looks like a surface lot design there, but what we were talking about is a sort of a, a mid-rise surface deck, if you will, something that raises the uh, parking deck level above kind of that area where the water intrusion often occurs during the tidal surges there, would still allow kind of that pervious um, uh, absorption of water again when tides recess and when tides come in but it would allow folks to be able to park in a manner that uh, they don't step out of the car and have to navigate and walk through the big, big mud puddles and, and big divots from tire ruts and things like that that exist in the lot today. Uh, it also creates 400 spaces, and I believe some of the information that we were provided today, there's about 300 cars or so that can park kind of unofficially in that area there. Um, we understand that you know there's a cost involved in this, of course, um, even at a, at a modest cost of about 10,000 a space, 400 spaces, you'd be looking at about a $4 million fee to do something like this. Um, but it's the cheaper option as opposed to creating the whole stormwater solution and allowing kind of that rainwater solution, if you will, to, uh, to be channeled and, and uh, brought back to the, uh, to the coastal water areas there. Um, so we're looking at things like grant opportunities here. Um, I realize there's quite a bit of writing on the page here, but uh, there is some opportunity, we believe, to uh, pursue some of these grant opportunities. And we, we talk a little bit more in depth in the report about that. So again, just a very high level concept. I don't think we, we felt comfortable just ignoring a solution for this, um, but it does provide an opportunity more, certainly more of a long-term opportunity to preserve that yacht basin uh, part of, of the community there. Uh, discussion came up in a lot of the stakeholder meetings of the traffic flow around the yacht basin uh, district there. And as it stands right now, we know it comes in on, on uh, West Bay Street there and then heads north on Yacht Basin Drive and then you have the opportunity to proceed north through the neighborhoods or in this case, turn right back on to Monroe and head back that way. Um,
for those that do come in on the Westmore Corridor, they're unable to turn southbound on Yacht Basin Drive, and of course they're forced to go north through the neighborhoods at that point. So we're proposing, uh, recommending this design of sort of realigning the traffic flow around the Yacht Basin District that allows somebody to come in either on Bay Street or on Moore Street, but if they come in on Bay, they would head north on Caswell and then turn west on to Moore and have that opportunity to turn southbound on Yet Basin and then turn uh, eastbound on to, uh, to West Bay Street there. So ideally, we think it you know, would help that flow there and give folks more access to the parking on Caswell as opposed to continuing following our, our GPS map on our smartphone that would certainly take us down Bay Street to Yacht Basin. Realize this probably warrants further discussion, but again, we like this idea of, of looking at a reroute there. Uh, loading uh, zones, uh, right now, as we know, uh, there are really no formal loading zones in Southport. Uh, the pictures we have on the screen here were um, often uh, what we experienced when we had boots on the ground walking around town. The, uh, the large uh, service delivery trucks are using the center turn lanes there and dropping the uh, goods and services out of their back gate and then, of course, wheeling it right across the vehicular lanes into the business there. The one on the lower left corner here was in that 100 block of Westmore, completely impeding traffic flow there. We were behind the truck taking this picture and, of course, couldn't necessarily veer around to the left of the truck without other oncoming traffic coming at us. Uh, so the, the concept drawing on the right uh, talks about some recommended areas that may be appropriate to implement temporary loading zones. And when I say temporary loading zones, I'm talking about more of a morning session to where that it becomes a loading zone up until maybe the midday meal period potentially could exist into the afternoon but then when your peak demands are here those spaces get turned back over to public parking inventory so sort of a shared concept of that loading zone space there um, golf carts we understand the golf carts are certainly a, a very vital part of Southport, and uh, we find that often in uh, communities in North and South Carolina along the coastal line there. We think this idea of continuing with the golf cart recommendations uh, to include uh, this idea of designing golf cart parking whenever there's sort of a redevelopment of a city or county owned property there. I know the Center of the Arts uh, uh, property building there was something that was considered at the time. Uh, so we think, you know, as, as designs for these types of projects come in, that there should be some more consideration for golf cart parking in and around the Southport area there. You can get effectively more people access to properties with a much smaller vehicle like a golf cart compared to an automobile. Um, bike parking. I think I might have jumped over one too. Oh, wait a minute. i got to go backwards. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so the bicycle parking. Um, it, you know, it, it appears that Southport is certainly moving in the direction of, you know, pushing more bicycle parking operations. These were random photos that we were able to take around town showing kind of the inventory, public and private, of where bike, uh, bike parking exists today. Some of it very creative. Um, some of it uh, maybe a little difficult to find and utilize. I believe the one right there next to the Southport market is... You know, it's kind of hard to, how do you fit your bike in there in that sense? Um, but, and we, we actually to this date have never seen anybody uh, park a bike there. Um, but this idea of going towards more of a formalized adoption to, to the bike parking program there, not necessarily saying that this center picture with the protective roof on top, giving it more of a protective environment for bikes, that's kind of an extreme example there. But something like the, along those lines where if you build more of these identified type bike storage um, shelters and areas that as a bicyclist, I would probably feel more safer riding my bike and being able to secure and park my bike in those areas. Um, and of course, you know, with the adoption of uh, or the, uh, the adding the, uh, the bike service stations, uh, the, the tire inflation stations and the small repairs as well. Um, the, the image on the right there, uh, if you can see that, the green lines reflect the, the NC211 Greenway bike plan uh, coming in from the east and then, of course, heading north through town. 
We like this idea of adding a Southport community path for bicyclists, encourage folks to be able to uh, migrate from northern parts of Southport down to the, uh, to the coastal shore there uh, without using the main corridors. Riding bikes down Howe Street is, is uh, it's doable, but you know, there are other and, and better and safer methods to do that. So this sort of circulation plan lends itself to that uh, commuting option there. And then, of course, I talked about this. The, this is the, the House Street pedestrian cross, one of the House Street pedestrian crossings that exists today. We like this idea. Um, we like the idea of what the, um, uh, what's been done to sort of create a barrier for pedestrians and vehicle here, creating that shorter walking distance to actually cross House Street by using the, the bulb out system there, if you will. But of course, when you do this, you're probably looking at the loss of at least you know, two to four parking spaces on either side of the street, north of it and south of it. So, and of course, there's a cost associated with that. So as more and more of these become considered to create a more safe and walkable community there, once again, that's where we talk about the formalizing of parking on the 100 block west of Howe Street and where permissible on that 100 block east of Howe Street there. So in summary, um, we've kind of identified the five points here that um, should, we, we think should be focus areas for the community here as you plan for growth and development in the future. Um, and so that's the parking duration program, that's the additional inventory as needed, the yacht base and water tower areas, the pedestrian crossing, and then of course the loading bicycle and golf cart areas, the golf cart areas there. So I believe that summarizes it all. If there's any additional questions, inquiries at this point, I'd be happy to address those. Questions from the board? I have a few. Yeah. Um, so the parking duration um, analysis that shows the parking on Caswell, for example, you said you thought that that was employees parking. Um, if we were to put a parking uh, restriction there, then we're potentially pushing those employees further into the residential areas for parking. Is that the vision? Is let's move these people in front of somebody's house for the day instead of in a parking spot? Let me back up to that slide. One second here. There we are. So we're the Caswell area. We're leaving as green, which reflects uh, unregulated there. Um, but the uh, obviously the the Moore Street and Bay Street areas there, where there was more visitor parking there, that's what we were proposing putting the parking restrictions. So the goal really is to not really push the employees further into the neighborhood. But we believe there is some fringe area just outside of downtown. Uh, as an example, kind of that, that Nash, um, Dry, and Atlantic area over there on the right side of that graphic um, could be potentially more long-term parking for employees. So I guess the short answer to that, there may be some consideration of, of moving some of those folks into the neighborhood there. Um, but I think it's, you know, it warrants sort of further review of that to determine what that best solution would look like. Because when I was working at Provision Company, there's no way I was parking over on Dry Street and walking over. Yeah. Uh, and then if we go to the, uh, the proposed parking inventory additions for Cavanagh Park, uh, did that area get studied for the use? Say that, say that again? The, the Cavanagh Park additional parking that you said to consider formalizing per, um, the perpendicular parking there, Yeah. Um, did that area actually get studied during this? Because I don't see that anywhere else. We, we didn't see demand there when we were doing our observations there. I think what happened at the end was there was this need for taking a look at all of the park areas and creating more formalized parking around those areas. So you won't find that specifically in the report other than this particular slide recommendation. Okay, because I've ne the only time I've ever seen that um, used is during uh, events in that area. Yeah. I've never seen, yeah. um, and I live on that side of town and my children play in that park, I've never seen a need for any additional parking there. Sure. Um, on the 300 East Bay Street additional parking inventory um, where you're considering um, adding parking on the, I guess that's the northern side of Bay Street. Mm -hmm. um, there's a hill there. There is. Uh, so yep. th that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to begin, even if we have right of way there, to start digging out the hill, and then we're going to have to do some sort of uh, bracing of the hill so it doesn't fall down onto um, the street there. Yeah. Just. 
know. Yeah, the retainer wall solution would be required of that site. And again, I think when you talk about this idea of, okay, do we need to add more parking? What are the options? Something like that is more of a lower cost option than perhaps building structured parking or something to that effect. I, think that's I don't know that a retaining wall there would really be less costly than doing that, but that's just a thought process. And then when we get down to the yacht basin, um, the proposed parking area with the 402 spaces, um, that land is owned by individuals. Right. It, it would involve a public-private partnership for that, right? And it's, so as, as that continues, or if that becomes discussion topic, I think something like this could be the basis for the starting point of that discussion. And then if, if we're talking about raising that area so it doesn't have water intrusion, we're just pushing the water into the businesses that are down there. So it's not a solution to be able to step out of your car into a dry space if then you're waiting uh, knee deep to a restaurant there to try and get to sure. what your goal is. Sure. Uh, and then um, going to the loading zone, um, do we have? Do you have uh, the times of day that you were seeing those trucks loading? I, I tend to see them earlier in the morning. Mid morning. Yeah. Um, Absolutely, they were most of them were mid morning. I think very seldom do we see one in the afternoon. Uh, but I know a lot of the goods come from Wilmington and areas where that timing is sometimes an issue. Um, has has it been an issue, or are we creating an issue for something that isn't actually an issue? Those were actual observations. Uh, again, whether or not it's an issue to take action on, I think would be discussion by the the board here in the community. But those were just as we as we took a look at it, there were some safety concerns involved with that. Okay, and then um, when we're looking at the bicycle path, um, if DOT is already looking at doing the bicycle path down Lord Street, um, why would we? duplicate their work on Caswell as well? If, if in fact that is the plan, which you say, um, so it, you know, it could make sense to use that same corridor there just to extend it uh, to Lord from Caswell and, and eliminate Caswell. But that was, I know when we put this together, it was pretty early on and we weren't sure of the progress of what DOT was doing. So this was just a recommendation that came up. The DOT it goes up Lord Street currently. Okay. I think that's it for me. I just wanted to bring those items to the attention of the board as well. Um, a couple of questions here. Uh, go ahead, Frank. You talk about uh, paid parking. Uh, you really didn't think that was an option at this point in time. Uh, why not? Uh, your, your demand is not consistent enough. There are peak period days. There are peak period times. But when we looked at the typical demand period, it just was not as steady throughout the day. I think um, a couple things would warrant paid parking, and that would be, of course, when, when everything was parked full. And we never really saw everything parked full other than a couple of block faces and limited corridors in that sense. As more infill development and redevelopment occurs, it's very potential, uh, very possible to get to that. We just didn't think that was necessary today. There's sort of an interim step to get there by enforcing that turnover and see what sort of change that creates in Southport before going to paid parking. How would you enforce the, uh, the turnover? These are three hours. How would you go about enforcing that other than it, having somebody go around and look at it? That's how you would exactly do it. You would have to have a compliance officer that would be obviously recording uh, times of, of initial parking, and once it exceeds whatever that duration is, they would issue the civil citation for that. So in other words, Chief Coring would have to have somebody else on the payroll. Uh, or, yep, I guess there's, there is a cost involved with that, absolutely, yeah. Then I, I, ha I have to defer to you because this will be the first time, man. Go ahead. Okay. On this page with the questions. Yeah, that's the next slide. Or the slide after that. Yes. Uh, one of the things my eyes went to immediately um, is 400, uh, I'm sorry, 14 vehicular uh, spaces in front of which, what is. Uh, St. Philip's Church, mm -hmm. directly across the street. And um, we at the St. Philip's were quite surprised to lose the parking there. Yeah. Uh, and 
we lost it at about the same time that the uh, pedestrian bump outs were being put in. Uh, and we found out that, of course, East, we knew East Moore Street is a state road, and this was a decision by the state. They felt that the curve right at Dry Street was, um, it, it made it difficult and unsafe to have any parking in front of the church. Yeah. When you were doing the survey, did you consult with DOT at all we did about not. what's possible? We did not at that particular point there. This, this was a, an initial graphic that was created. I guess I wasn't prepared to talk to it, but I wanted to kind of have this image there of showing where some of the parking was, but realize that this is inaccurate in that specific area there. It was. Thank you, ma'am. Alderman Mosteller. Um, thank you. Um, just a, a few observations to piggyback on, um, on Rebecca's conversation. Um, the, in front of where we are, um, I measured the road and it's 30, the asphalt is 30 feet wide, which we now have parallel parking as part of that with two travel lanes. So it would be digging in to um, Rebecca's point to our hill, which I think that would not be something that we would be consistent with how, what we think about that space, number one. Um, and then um, there, there were like three or four natural uh, spaces you might could pick up that were closer to um, this over here, that it was wide enough that you could conceivably put some of what do you call those, tire stoppers or whatever? Wheel stops. Wheel yeah. stops. Yeah. You could put, maybe create three or four parallel, because that wouldn't require anything. And and we allow, we allow grass, I mean, we have a lot of parking that has grass, and that's why when I went to Cabinets, speaking of that, um, all of that is grass there that people can utilize that way. So, I mean, I guess you could put wheel stops there. But, and then to that point, there are at least four things in this that I would like, we have members of the Parks and Recs Advisory Board here, I would like um, the park related items to go to them for their consideration, maybe give us some feedback about that. Um, and um, then back to the yacht basin. So we do know that that is private property. Correct. Uh, and I think it would be uh, many years before any of that possibly could happen. In the interim, the planning board in the past has uh, talked about this overlay and creating that and working with the property owner. So I would hope that that would be a renewed um, opportunity for the planning board to consider and have that dialogue. Uh, when you're talking about, and I'm, I'm assuming you were given, we had a, a yacht basin mobility study yes. done, and I'm sure you go given yes. that. And Rebecca, you'd be much more in tune with this, but part of the conversation and the reason we did not reverse it the way you're saying is because the flooding starts in front of Fishy. So we would be reversing it through the beginning. Got it. So that, that's part of the reason why the path is the path that it is okay. and how that decision was made. So I think that's, that's important to know from that. Um, So, and, and I, I would hope that the planning board would be given a copy of this and that way they could rein in on it with us. Um, the <clears throat> I think I have, I think, I think, mo I think most everything else has been said. So I'll yield. Alderman Spencer. I don't. <clears throat> So, the Yacht Basin. There are major private stakeholders who carry their own weight. We're not paying for them to park. The people that go to their restaurants. It's probably the best deal we've got right now because everywhere else, sure. we're subsidizing. So I don't want to put anything else near the water. Why do, does everyone want to give it all away? 
Why do we want people here in the first place? So there's a philosophical question here as to do you want to add? Do you want to make it more congested? Do you want to make it harder to get in and out of an intersection? The majority of people live here or older people can't handle that kind of lifestyle. So we're feeding the fire by adding more spaces, especially down to the waterfront. Okay, so you've got some good ideas. The bike path could work out real well. You need to incorporate that mentality in with the connecting of the parks. Okay, you've missed a section on like the 400, 500 block of Atlantic Avenue. We own parking spaces there that are grass parking spaces. That's right. One side of that backs up to what I would say would be the connectivity of low white and Taylor Field. So you've got access points. We need to move our parking away from downtown. If they want to go downtown, they're going to have to walk. They're going to have to, and it'll help the other businesses. We don't want it all downtown. There are businesses on the House Street out the road that we need to share the love with. We don't just need to feed the downtown monster. Absolutely. That is tequila bars and breweries and uh, vape stores. Mark, I, w I will bring your attention to the fact that the, in the uh, survey, people only wanted to walk three to four blocks, and the largest um, barrier to on-foot commute was the personal physical limitations or health. I believe those are probably people that don't live in Southport. Because if you live in Southport, you can walk to all of it and, and do it every day as a ritual. Actually, I'd be interested in that. Do we know where the respondents came from? Were they residents? Were they from outside of South? So the, the initial question, I believe, with the combined comp plan survey did give, the first question, I believe, was that demographic question. So we have a percentage breakdown. I, I, it's in the larger survey, but that information should be available. We did it We did it city resident. We did Brunswick County. We, we really stepped it back, including the largest category would have been North or South Carolina resident. Yeah. The only thing that more will get us is more traffic and more headache. The, the normal property owner in Southport will never benefit from having the added traffic. Alderman Carroll, do you have any questions? You don't have to. I just <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Give me a mic. Um, so... <laughs> The only two, the only two things. Um, I think there was a question about uh, the policing, about the hourly. So, is there some self policing that takes place? Like, if you put up the sign and it says two hour parking, is it fair to assume that people follow that or? Many will, um, but <laughs> I'm, at, I'm just at, asking the question. At the end, um, it's I think it's human behavior that if folks realize that enforcement isn't, I'm not being held accountable. I won't be accountable at the end. It's a it's a terrible thing for me to say that out loud, but it's the truth. Right, yeah. no, we know, we understand that. And so, but with this signage, um, that also helps us in formalizing some of the parking that is otherwise not thought to be parking. Right. So there's some value there as well. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I like to imagine all the revenue we would get from paid parking, and then reality sets in and I realize how much it would cost just to enforce it. And I mean, somebody has to be out there, you know, checking the meters, checking how long they've been there in various ways. And then in the history of the known universe, Southport's never given anybody a parking ticket. Right. And that's one of our charms, I think. Go ahead, Frank. You know, one of the problems we face is, is kind of a philosophical problem. Uh, we've got a lot of nice restaurants downtown. Uh, restaurants operate on the razor thin margin. Uh, if we don't have tourists coming in here, then a town of 4,000 people can't support that many restaurants. Uh, and that creates part of the parking problem. I don't know. That's something we're going to have to deal with, and I don't know how, you know. We're getting into the play. As locals want to go down there, it's hard for them to find somewhere to park. And then if visitors come in, all the spaces are parked, they're taking some. 
That's something we have to come up with a way to balance that. Yeah, that's an interesting comment. Um, you know, the restaurants only have so many seats as they exist today, and they're heavily reservation-based, right? So if I'm not planning well in advance and try to get a 7.30 reservation on a Saturday night, it's they're probably going to tell me I either need it 4 o'clock or come back again at 9.30 at the end of the night or whenever that is. So there is a finite equation in there. Um, as more seats and more restaurants become available or as some of these restaurants expand their footprint, that certainly could attribute to more um, visitors coming in, ultimately creating a need for more parking spaces. Most of our restaurants are not reservation based. Most of them are first come, first serve. There are three that I can think of that do reservations. Okay. But do they give you sort of a, a, a buzzer or a callback type number in those cases? Mm -hmm. or? Um, there's one that will call your cell phone or text you when, you're, uh, when it's ready for yeah. you. The others, if you're not there, sorry. Yep. Okay. And that, that sort of polices the amount of visitors that can come in during a meal period in that sense. Police may not be the right word, but I think you understand where it might be coming from. Do you have another question? Yeah. Well, uh, just uh, observation. Um, I looked at 100 West St. George and 100 West Brown. Um, and at 100 West George, car, cars are hanging out in the road. That, that we need to address that as soon as possible by either making it parallel, a couple of parallel spaces there. But there was a car parked there overnight that was hanging out in the road because I went looking around this morning at, at Odart 30. So um, I would ask that we look at that um, immediately because that's a problem. Okay, uh, I have several questions. You talked about the danger in a dry street area for accidents, cheap coring. Do we have accidents in, in the dry street area? Okay. Um, did you, it appears, and I, correct me if I'm wrong here, that your study went from basically a morning to about maybe 8 p.m. Where the peak activity hours okay. were, correct. So my question has always been, is there spots that are on your chart with the orange dots and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. uh, and those are only highlighting the highest concentration of cars that are there for a long time. Um, if in the yacht basin, there's a lot of cars that seem to be parked 24 hours a day. Most likely, they're going over to that island over there, not because they care about skipping off on the parking fee at the Deep Point Hawk Marina. That's sure they've got enough money to go to Bolt They don't need to worry about that. What they're doing is they're picking up these private ferries that will ask, take them when they want to go there, and we'll pick them up and bring them back. The same thing is happening at the end of Fish Factory Road, the end of that where. Uh, Rusty Hook and the marina is down there. The place is packed 24 hours a day, not because of the marina or the restaurant. It's because people are using the private ferries to get over there. So a, a enforcement program would tend to push them back to the marina and have to use the ferry. And they'd have to work, work that out with the, with, the, with the people over there. So I, I like that I idea of the enforcement. Uh, just as a a re-education, if we were to start writing parking tickets tomorrow, we would not get a penny for that because none of the funds would come to us because we have not, we, not so much this board, but in the past, we have not done and asked the Raleigh to give us permission to, to absorb, to take the fines and put them towards us. Oak Island did that. So they have depending on what numbers you're looking at, they get $1.2 million for their parking program, but all that money stays in Oak Island. If we were to do enforcement from, this is the time we're, we're gonna need to write it now for it, get ahead of the curve, to have the enabling legislation to allow us to keep our own fines. So we need to put that on, the, on our agenda to do that. Um, you, you, when you looked at, always mispronounce this name, the cavernous park. Your reply was there wasn't enough turnover, enough, enough issue there to worry about it. When you looked at Kingsley Pier, 
there was enough people parked at Kingsley Pier to to justify more additional parking? It, so Kingley, Kingsley had just was just coming online when we looked at that. There was not, I think it was just reopening again. I go by there every day just yeah. for fun. And during car shows, during massive influx of people here, two cars. Two cars, yeah. It needs better lineage. It needs signs. It needs things. It needs stuff mm -hmm. uh, where the, the, the gravel is because we, we need to make sure that they're not parallel parking, they're 90 degree parking. Um, but that's that's a different issue. I, I just haven't seen the need there yet. Okay. Um, the, the area down, and I know I'll be running a foul of Alderman Spencer on this, uh, but we can do that friendly. Um, the area down by the Yacht Basin, that's owned by three people, more or less. By happenstance, I was standing next to one of the owners a couple weeks ago, as he was filling his trailer up to go westbound for supplies to the hurricane thing. And he and I got into a chat about that because I never knew where his property was, and he showed it all to me, and he explained to me, and, and all of them in has explained to me before, our UDO, if we were to allow a section of the, and correct me if I'm wrong, Karen, the section of the UDO that would allow someone to build a parking lot, if we gave them that code section, because it's, it's zoned it now for residential, correct? They could do that for a year, a day, whatever, and then immediately they would still have the right to build buildings and all kinds of stuff there. So that is one, if I understood it, that is why the thing never got off the ground back in the day. And we, the elected officials, whether it's this seven or past sevens, um, never changed the UDO to allow just for a parking parking lot. Very restrictive thing to do that. Um, so I'm not sure that the owners would want to sell the property to us. Um, I think they might, at least one of them, certainly showed an interest in leasing it to the city for a very reasonable amount of money uh, that we could then put stone down just to smooth it out. I'm not trying to redirect the water um, sure. and put parking spaces in there. Now, are we going to do that and not charge a fee? Well, that's a political decision we'd have to make on that. But I think there's an opportunity now for us to decide whether or not that's the direction we want to go in and then come up with a wording of how we would have a UDO code that would allow for that to happen and get and then after if we agree to that then the next step would be to talk to the owners to see if they'd be willing to lease it to us but we've been chatting about this for years on end go ahead Karen okay so the, it is right now zone residential, which makes it um, a violation to have commercial parking on it. That, well, the, of those lots, those resi the residential, there are four residential lots there. So that said, we would not change, the, I can't say we would not, but it would not, probably be unlikely to change the ordinance that says you can park commercially on residential because that could happen then anywhere in our... So no, what, I'm talking about changing it from residential to something else. Well, that is the whole... The whole point is that there, there's a lot of factors that have been discussed previously about all of this, and that's why the over, creating an overlay district that just allows parking rather than rezoning it from residential. If you rezone it from residential, that residential, I think if you talk to those neighbors around there, they feel like that's a buffer right now. There, in the future, there may be a mixed use and some kind of thing that happens, but in the near term, um, to have a parking overlay that would allow parking with standards. Uh, it's, it's not just a matter of throwing gravel out. You don't want to just have a big old sea of gravel thrown out there without parking standards, just like we would want parking standards with buffers. And it may be that the city comes in and we create a buffer. We've got a very wide right of way there on Caswell. Uh, and so we could add buffer in there ourselves plantings, um, but all of that because of flooding 
<laughs> is uh, and brackish water and all of that is all a, a involved conversation that we need the planning board to come up with what those standards are. And where are we with that, with the planning board doing that? Well, they... After, after how many years of this discussion, my real point is, I'm not trying to be argumentative, I'm just saying, when do we go and say, go forth and do good work? It had a, it had a breakdown with one of the property owners, uh, That's some in the communication past. stuff okay. in the past. So I think, we, I think that that discussion is coming up in the planning board to do the overlay. I think we, we make the request for them to do that well, that's, that's, and move it that's, forward. That's my point. That, and is I'm that, all for do, do we, and, and so to make a request to the planning board, it would take a motion and a second and a vote to say, do X. What I've noticed in the past is that at the end of the day, I'm sitting here going, I think we asked Mo to do something, but I have no idea what we asked her to do because I did not structure the conversation well enough to give the, the staff the direction that they needed to go. I'll take the blame for that, but I want to do it better now. So if we're going to ask them to do something, maybe we could bring this back on the, this, this one thing, back on the 14th, so we have some thought about it, and then ask if the vote is to do, ask the, the planning board to do something, well, let's start the ball roll. Well, uh, yeah, I agree we should. Well, I, we should. Uh, I, I don't want to do a new knee jerk, and I'm not sure that we know what wording we want to have. Well, what, what are we the, asking them to do? To create an overlay district, language, to put together language for an overlay district. For right. parking only? A parking overlay district, correct. Okay. If the if for those four lots, it would if, be for if those the board four. wants to go in that direction, I'm happy. I'm also happy to go down the 14th. Well, you know, to instruct the planning board to spend any time on this without having some conversation with the owners first seems a little premature to me. That is part of the process. Mo will tell you that they that's where they start with that conversation. That, that because you, we need to have their input. So that, that is the work of the planning board, and then they bring all of this back to us. And they, one of the things they could be coming back to us with is one of the property owners doesn't want to do this. So this is what we recommend. Da 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 da. Can we just be careful not to overregulate? Like they're. Yes, it's not conforming right now. They're they're not doing what they're supposed to because we don't have an overlay, and I agree that we need to have some sort of overlay. Uh, but when we start talking about standards and that, in order to be able to do that, uh, we're also running the risk of saying, you know what, we don't want to do this anymore. We're closing the front So we need to make sure that we're not overregulating something that is working right now, even though technically it's not. I, I don't think it's I don't think it's working for the neighbors, and I know that's a small group of people. But there's no there's no regulation, there's no guidelines for this is how we keep dust down. You know, if you if you ride to that intersection, there's sand and shit everywhere. So you know, with some guidelines and expectations, I think it would be a what? Oh, it's sorry. Um, so I just think that, you know, having their buy-in is going to be a much better approach. And I, I think that that buy-in probably starts at this level. That's exactly where I was. Instead of shooting something, which I, where I started, instead of shooting something to the planning board to go do something first, we should decide whether or not we even want to go there. I'm, I, maybe, I'm, may, maybe I'm being... Um, a little egotistical here, but I think that we, who work, who know all those people down there, some group, subgroup, should have this conversation. Yeah. Not, well, maybe. I mean, the plan. Just to be clear, the plan board has had these conversations before with the property owners. There was, some, I think, some communication, something, and then maybe some change in staff I, and all of that that it broke down. But that. They had a work committee and they have met with them. So what they need to do is rekindle that process. So
so it fell apart last time. For not because. So. No, go ahead. I want you to do it. To... So it it just didn't come to fruition, is what I would say. Though I think communication and there were some changes and that sort of thing. Uh, our planning staff is nodding their head. The, I think the appropriate thing, and I think we can all agree that we want to have legal parking there. And so in order to do that, we need to create an overlay district for that parking. And, we, and it we, doesn't mean because it's an overlay, I'm sorry, Mo, to interrupt you. It doesn't mean because we create the district, they have to do it. They can then elect to do it or not elect to do it. So the, that's, I think that's important in this conversation. Multiple times in the last few years, as the parking in that area has built up and built up, we have heard from neighbors, one of whom is here, uh, about the problems that the dust, especially the dust and the grime, have caused because this is just helter-skelter parking on sand, dirt, and we've been begged to do something about that and to at least put up some kind of a buffer. And we've done nothing. So, I, I mean, I think the right starting place today is we make a motion to ask the planning board, to instruct the planning board to study this and come back to us with recommendations that would include what to do, what the owners of the properties prefer, recommendations for buffers. This is the work of the planning board. Now we don't have to accept what they bring to us and we have rejected things many times. But let's start with this. I'd be happy to make a motion right now. You certainly well, are entitled to make that motion, Flo. <laughs> okay, I will make a motion. Are you willing to entertain a motion right now? I uh, <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I move that we instruct the planning board to study an overlay for parking in the uh, Yacht Basin area between South Caswell, West Boar, Yacht Basin Drive, and West Bay. That block and to come back to the, to the board with recommendations about whether we should enact, you know, basically as a, as a UDO amendment, um, the possibility of a parking overlay. Is but there I, a second to the motion? Enough. I, I would say that it pertains to the four residential lots. They already have, the commercial lots already have rules and regulations about them. So this would be creating an overlay for the four residential lots. Okay. To, to refine my motion for the four residential lots currently within that block. Is, it, it, is there a second to the motion? I'm sorry, Robert, were you going to say something? Uh, yes. If we're, now that we've, we're going to have a motion and a second, is there a discussion? Yes. Um, so there are commercial lots that can legally have parking on them with standards. Are the standards currently being met? That would be a question for enforcement. I truly don't know. I, I don't know. And it may be that they're grandfathered in. Those things have been there. Mo's nodding. Those little slots have been that way for an extraordinarily long time. I think perhaps once we create overlay district standards, then maybe they would pick up on those and maybe help implement. But I think that would fall under the category of grandfathered. Part of the, yeah. What's happening? Um, so we can look into it, but yes, they were established many years ago. So if they're not up to our current standards, unless they do any major reconstruction, then we wouldn't have, we, they wouldn't have to come into compliance at this point. 
But if there was an overlay on those, the four residential lots, then they would have to come into compliance. One of the things that I see, you know, we need to take into consideration is I would love for the parking to look like what they've drawn here. So how do we, how do we incentivize them to actually do this? How do we incentivize these owners to actually follow through? And that might take an investment on our part with gravel or with, I mean. I, I think the way it was explained to me by one of the three is that they would lease it and we would do that. If, if we want to have that kind of more formalized parking, then we, the city, perhaps in collaboration with them, and uh, cost sharing, because let's face it, the parking in that area allows those businesses to survive. So well, there's a mutual benefit for all of this. The question I have eventually down the road, and we don't have to decide that today, is do, then do we have paid parking just in that particular lot to pay to recoup our costs if we have to do that? We can talk about that later, but I just throw it out for consideration. I also want to make sure, for the record, that none of this that we're doing right now would would require the owner to do anything. So I know that has been on the mind of one of these people, that if you do this overlay, you're going to force me to do something that I don't want to do, unless I, unless I I'm talking for the owner unless I'm a participant in the whole thing. So I want to make sure everybody understands that part. We're not, we're not shoving this down their throats. We're looking to see what is this going to look like. So. Sir. So you're saying that just because you are allowed to do something doesn't mean that you have to. Correct. Is that correct? Correct. So Alderman Spencer. I think that what you originally said, I'm going to say no, to, I'm going to vote no on this. Because I feel like our planning board is like we're hiding behind them to make a decision and interact. And it's almost like slamming it down their throat. Versus going to them and respecting their property ownership rights and having a meeting of the minds before we have our planning board do our dirty work for us. I'm not sure that that's what we're trying to do, Alderman Spencer, but I can understand how somebody might, if, who's not in this room and not listening to this, might interpret it. So I, too, have, I'm wondering if we should, should, should we bring the owners in to a, to a subcommittee ad hoc group? I'm just asking, just shooting an idea out there, to have them talk to us whether they're even willing to even entertain this before we do a whole lot of work on this whole thing. I think two of the three might be convinced to do that. The third one, if they choose not to do that, that's their property, do what they want to do. And we may not get 400 spaces, but we get something else. Uh, but uh, I want to make sure that, we're, that, that the city as a whole is adequately communicating all of this to the owners. I, th I think that's our planning staff and our planning and, and, and board. I, I am not sure. Because that's what they do is they form a, a small committee, an ad hoc, if you will, work committee, and then that's how they work it, it's rather than it being us. But because it's a zoning thing, it would have to go through text amendment, all this. No, they would do all the work, but the, the, this this is as much political as it is technical. It truly is. Um, so that's that was my only concern. The planning planning staff and the planning board certainly can do all of their stuff that they're supposed to do. I'm not questioning that part. But the original discussion with them, I, I'm with Mark on that, so I'm just telling you what my thoughts are what the will of the board is, what the will of the board is. But this is what the planning board does. As Karen was saying, the planning board talks to the owners and gets all of the input from them about what, what their thinking is, what they want, what they don't want. And then when they finally come to us with their recommendations, that's a multi-step process too, because we have public hearing. 
both from the public, and we have a chance to hear again from the, uh, from the property owners. But I emphasize ultimately that this is not something that any of those four residential property owners would have to do. It would just be an option for them. I mean, I might be able to have a swimming pool in my backyard. You can. I, can, I don't think I can. But if I, if I could, would I do it? No. <laughs> I don't have to put in the darn swimming pool. And the other thing I would point out is currently those lots are being used for parking that is in violation. So well, if we go down that road, that conversation. If we're going to go down that road of telling them they can't do it unless they do our thing, I don't want to be around when that happens. What? You're, we, <laughs> we're going to kill a whole bunch of businesses if we say we threaten them with you're, you're in violation and we want to hit them with a fine. It will be a disaster economically and politically and everything else for the city. That, that yacht base, whether you like it or not, is a huge attraction and a huge thing that the citizens of Southport want to have. They walk through water, they park their cars in salt water. I don't understand it when I first came here. I've learned to appreciate it. Um, but that, that, we cannot start throwing those words around. Well, I beg the question for now and move on. Okay, we, we have a motion on the floor. Yeah, we have a motion on the floor and we have a second. Is there any more discussion on this side of the aisle? Okay. Uh, all in favor of the motion as stated, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. All opposed? Aye. It's five to one. We move forward with it. So, sir, if you would come back up to the podium there. Okay. Certainly. Um, uh, I, I wanted to, I had some questions about the area around the water tower. Um, on the inside of the water tower fence that's adjacent to the property on the corner, I guess used to be an old gas station uh, originally, uh, there's some signs on there that says parallel parking only, and they, they look kind of like homemade signs, so I'm not sure they're like laminated signs, so I'm not sure what that is. I, I, I would like... I pulled up the GIS for that area, and we have a huge amount of right-of-way uh, for parking and that sort of thing the business, behind the businesses. There's a lot of, I think, parking that's not being utilized there is uh, good. So I would ask that at some point, I don't know if you're aware, did you, I'm sure you looked at the GIS. We, and we so uh, I noticed you said something about not allowing parking on dry on dry street in that 300 block but we have homes there that we can't that's not an option yeah. um so but i do think better planning and uh, the idea of get of not the tree it's a hazard there y'all i you know just because we've not had a tragedy doesn't mean we don't need to look at the safety of all that and um even on the corner where um the water tower is just the very corner where people park there being thoughtful about that, I, I, I would ask, and perhaps, I don't know, our police chief is very familiar with that area. Perhaps he could take this, these conversations and, and come up with a plan there. The other thing I would say, in front of Dry Street Pub and Pizza, the first two spaces are, are, not, long, are not long enough to keep you out of the road. So I don't know if those ought to be golf cart. Those are all in right of way, and I, I appreciate that the owner's taken the initiative to create a handicap space and all of that. But my question would be in there to be thoughtful, maybe the other two spaces that are longer on the other side versus the first two, because maybe they could be golf cart parking. Because they're, I, I'm just telling you, they're too short. Well, can they be expanded? I, I, don't, I, don't, I haven't stood there, in other words. It's our right away. If we want it to be parking, that would fall to us to do that. Well, yeah, that could that could be. I'm just talking about what it is right this minute. Perhaps that could be more conversation. Yeah, you know, one of the pictures on these spaces, water tower redesign. Mike, 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 Mike,
looking down at that and looking down at Dry Street Pub, lo and behold, there's a, a car. This is the aerial photo. Can you show that? You it's got up. it? Yep. Okay. There's an aerial photo showing a car stuck out into the street. And so we need to find a way to address that. It looks like it's not pulled all the way in if you look at that photo closely. It looks could like be backing what? out of the space at the time that the photo is taken. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. It looks like it's not pulled all the way in in that photo, so perhaps it's backing out of the space as this photo is taken. The large photo off to the Can the members of the public who are, who are here see these images well enough to know what we're chewing on here? In other words, it, I have to say that I got distracted for a second. Where are we in this discussion? Uh, is there any more questions? I was just sent a photo of a truck parked in front of Dry Street Pub and Pizza, pulled all the way in without hanging out into the um, into Dry Street at all. I'd be happy to pass my phone around if anyone wants to take a look at that. Is that in the parking area or in their driveway? It is in front of... Uh, in front of Dry Street, there is a, um, next to the um, handicap spot, there is a uh, wheel bumper there that is pulled all the way up to the wheel bumper. So whether or not there's enough space, whether we can do that, that is to me a minor issue that we can probably correct by just looking at it and deciding if we have to do it. So is there any further questions for the presenter at this time? Uh, I've got one stir the pot question. Um, have you ever seen intersections be closed down and what the effect would be on parking if you did that? Let's go to this example that they're talking about here at Dry Street around, uh, what would that be, St. George or Owen or no, no, St. Brown. Brown. Yep. <clears throat> Those are, I've said this before about Fodale, they're becoming dangerous intersections when people are trying to beat traffic to cut across to, to get onto these side roads. And so even last weekend we had a business, the Tiki Bar and all, that requested that we shut down an intersection. Uh, and I, I spoke to the business owners, and I'm like, what about if we shut it down forever and put a sidewalk there? What would be the effect of parking on the main road and the interior of the road, creating parking pockets at each of those intersections rather than intersections that we risk our lives in every day? So closing down some intersections to add parking. Have you ever done anything like that? You can. I, I think in large part it's, you know, be a community involvement process because those residents that live in those areas, they may have come quite accustomed to using that as circulation to sure. move in and out of their neighborhood. So it's been done. I've seen it be implemented, reversed, re-implemented, reversed. Sometimes that happens, <laughs> which is unfortunate. Yeah. But um, I, 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 well, I'll let, I'm sorry, go ahead. Again, we're starting to see the congestion of trying to cross two lanes of traffic on House Street without a stoplight 
during the middle of the day, you might as well be playing Frogger. So I'm serious. And, and it's becoming not really a reality of doing that. So why don't we look at thinking about change? It's just a suggestion. Sure. That we look at to see what we would acquire if we did a few intersections that were dangerous. Rebecca, you have your mic on. Any other questions? Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate it. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, sir. Uh, I would just like to ask the question, did your survey include citizen input as to spillover parking into residential neighborhoods? Any thoughts on that? We, we didn't have a specific question that discussed that, but there were a couple of open-ended questions for folks to provide comment along those lines. Um, it, it wasn't, I think, if anything, I remember it came up in the stakeholder meetings. There was some of this city-controlled right-of-way that folks have sort of compromised in a, as an extension of their property. In other words, created sort of sitting areas or decorative landscaping areas out in some of these areas around some of the larger oak trees that might be in some of those right-of-way areas. Very little discussion came up, but there was a comment or two, you know, why are they able to do this when that's considered potentially valuable parking inventory for the neighborhood? That was about what I remember, I think, the most common one that came up. Where I'm going with this is when we have events in the downtown and people park into the neighborhoods, were the neighborhood folks commenting about that? Um, I think it was one of those that folks just, the short answer is no, but I think um, folks just come to realize that there are these types of capacity events and they're going to flow in 9, 10 o'clock in the morning and then by 5 or 6 in the afternoon it all dissipates, you know, with the exception of the 4th of July celebration. That's, a, that's kind of an all-day and all-nighter kind of thing, but um, we didn't have a lot of comment on that, no. Mm -mm. Now, I suspect if you were to you know, create these regulatory issues for the commercial areas. There may be folks looking to find the unregulated areas for parking, and that could potentially move into some of the neighborhoods. So that's kind of the cause and effect that as you discuss and um, review these types of recommendations that you consider that. Are you done, sir? Okay. I was just going to ask that we make an amendment to the... Uh, Agenda to move the 4th of July festival. Okay. Um, oh, we got uh, the other thing, the thing I would say is um, for the planning staff around the bicycle path, I thought all that was really good. Um, and I know it reflects some of the county plan for the Greenway. Uh, we have a lot of old signs around town and uh, Heather, Heather can talk about what that program used to be or whatever, but they're old rusted signs. So if the planning staff, I, I'm assuming this would be something for our planning staff as far as kind of figuring out this pathway and new signage and all of that sort of thing, but maybe also removing the random bicycle signs that are around town that are left over from something that was many years ago. You're talking about the planning staff, not the planning board. The, yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. All right, Robert, do you want to make a motion? Uh, yes, I'd like to make a motion that we move uh, agenda item F3 to uh, to number two and two to number three. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? It's unanimous, and we're going to take a, f and I mean this, five-minute break.
want to um, say good morning to everyone and um, if we haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet I'm Lucinda Arnold and I'm the current president of the North Carolina 4th of July festival I'm very excited to be in this position um, I've been on the board now for approximately four years um, and have some great leaders in front of me and we have a very strong board um, and so I'm just very excited to get started and be in front of you all this morning um, I wanted to first of all thank the city for your overall just wonderful support and generous uh, gen generosity to the festival. Um, Y'all are just a great partnership for us to be able to make sure that we are able to bring 4th of July to everybody that comes here and just to this city. Um, because we are all very passionate about the 4th of July. It's a wonderful way for us to celebrate our patriotism, and we're so glad that you all um, have wanted to partner with us in this festivity. Uh, we know that it's the largest festival that Southport puts on, and again, the support that you all give us through, whether it's security, whether it's the fire department. Um, I feel that we're a great team, that we work together well, and I'm um, very excited to uh, be here and in this capacity today. Um, we have brought forth to you, you should have received a packet um, from Elena Taylor. Um, and in that packet, you should be seeing a couple of different things. I apologize, I haven't seen the actual packet, but the first um, item was the general statement of job. Um, this is the one, it's the same one that you've seen in the past, but Elena being the Director of Community Relations, she's asked for some wording to be changed. Um, before it stated that Elena was the person that would be um, like our sole admin for the festival, but Elena has asked that under, and you can see it under the first one here, under general supervision, performs a variety of clerical scheduling reporting. She's asking that her staff, just not her, be able to um, be part of the admin for the 4th of July. And we are very accepting of that. Um, Elena does a wonderful job for the 4th of July festival and for you all. Um, she's a pleasure to work with, and if this is her recommendation, then we are very good with that on our side. Um, and then um, there's also the service agreement. Um, this is the same agreement that has been brought forth before, and uh, that's about, and then I understood that in your packet you should be seeing um, a copy of the bylaws. I know that there is the new board that has uh, been brought forth um, for this year. And, and, and I want to make sure, too, that everybody understands that um, the president serves a one-year term. 
um, so that that way everybody understands that that I'm I'm here for the year. Um, so and I'm very excited about that. But um, if there's any questions that I can answer for you, um, Hugh Fosbury is my senior vice chair, and uh, so if we if you have any questions that we can um, answer for you, we'd be happy to do that. Alderman Davis. Well, I want to talk about fireworks, but if other people have things to talk about before that, um, I yield. Alderman Carroll. Uh, yeah, I'd like to just say that uh, thank you, uh, Alderman Kelly, for allowing me to sit in in your absence on the uh, uh, recent meeting. This group of uh, volunteers is incredible. You know, they are able to pull off uh, something pretty amazing. And I think we can all agree that without the festival, um, it, it, ju it just wouldn't be the same. So thank you to all of you uh, who participate and who give back. And, and also to Elena and her staff. Um, watching her at these meetings uh, is really impressive because she is getting things done, uh, texting, uh, you know, somebody to, to make something happen. So really impressive. Um, and I'm glad that we have this relationship with the, with the festival now. Well, I don't have much. Shoot, I <clears throat> So the land taking that role is, is taking on or relieving probably twenty to $25,000 that we were paying before that. That didn't go to anything but the administration year. So we're taking over those roles to save the Fourth of July that money so that the money can go towards the events and not go to administration. So we are digging deep to support the Fourth of July. Digger, deeper than we've generally been in a long time. Because of that. First thing. So so we're excited. And uh, Fourth of July will always be the staple of the uh, of Southport. Uh, and, and you are in a role that I always dreamed of having. <laughs> I Alderman never was on my radar, but President of the Fourth of July, you have made it. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you. All in LA. The Fourth of July festival has always been very, very important. Uh, my wife and I were, of course, longtime friends who. We're here 22 years ago before the July Festival, and we walked in the door. The first thing they wanted to do when we were visiting down in South Carolina this past week was that we interested with you guys in South for the 4th of July was fantastic. That's something they will always remember. Of course, they always remember the traffic and the They had a very lasting impression. We better now. Oh, yeah. That's it. <laughs> no, fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you. One more thing, I'm going to beat you to it. We had a conversation a day or two ago about a big web uh, point. 250 years of, of will be next year, and you'll be in charge of that, right, you? So I'm excited to see how we're going to celebrate 250 years in South Carolina. Well, didn't finish in South so. We're already starting to think about that. Um, so just so you all know, obviously we're planning this year's 4th of July, but we're also thinking ahead, uh, Alderman Spencer, we're also thinking ahead um, as to what we need to do to make it the biggest and the best as always. Um, and I just wanted to point out that safety is always a very large concern for us, making sure that the people that, the, not only that the residents, but those that are visiting with us are also very safe um, and Chief, Chief Coring does an amazing job. Um, it's an orchestration beyond anybody's imagination. Um, I felt that having it down at the waterfront this year, um, relieving some congestion downtown Southport because we now have the trolleys. Um, we were doing our best to keep everybody informed. I'm not sure, hopefully you saw that we created a map um, and, you know, if you visit a large theme park, you get a map. And um, I'm not trying to say Southport turns into a large theme park, but we're trying to make it um, more user-friendly, where everybody understands where the bathrooms are, 
where there's handicapped parking, where you pick up a trolley, where the trolley drops you off. Um, I felt having it down at the waterfront was the best thing that we've ever done. Um, the way that the stage was positioned, the music was coming into um, into Southport, just not facing towards the water. Um, and um, again, I believe, and Chief Coring can take in uh, definitely um, let me know if I'm not saying this correctly, but I believe that we only had one soft barrier, um, and that was down by Oliver. So the rest of it was all Jersey barriers. So again, a very just secure area, and a lot of thought and planning was put into that to make that happen. I have moved to the one microphone that works, <laughs> mainly because this is so important. I think it is extremely important, especially to combat veterans in this community. Um, every year I've brought this up, and I've brought it up because it's been brought to my attention by veterans and veterans groups um, with whom I am somewhat active, so known to them. Uh, and so this year, since I haven't been successful in the past, I did some research and I wrote what I wanted to say. We all know that Disney is one of the most successful businesses in the whole world. Disney succeeds because they know what people want. People go to Disney parks because they want memorable, exciting experiences. And Disney knows very well how to provide that. Disney knows that any sort of bad experience is very bad for business. So Disney devotes as much time to research into what people don't want as they do into what people do want. And they have learned from many customer complaints that fireworks can be a turnoff if they're too loud. So Disney, being Disney, and having more money than the rest of the world, it seems like, they created their own pyrotechnics company that makes their fireworks. And they have set their maximum noise level for their fireworks at 70 decibels, which is about the sound of being 10 or 15 feet away from a lawnmower. And that's, of course, much lower than the 120 to 127 decibels that they previously used and that we have here in Southport. It is the equivalent of being right next to a bulldozer or a jet plane taking off. Now, Disney knows that it's the visuals, the spectacle, that people like most about fireworks, not necessarily the sound. Sites that are good enough don't have to use loud noise. Now Disney listened to its customers, especially its war veterans, for whom the sound of bombs, cannons, and gunfire. Just think about the different types of fireworks that we see in here. Some of them are rat-a-tat-tat, just like machine guns, some of them are loud booms, like cannons, some of them are quick blasts, like landmines going off. Those are the common sounds that accompany most of the fireworks here in Southport. And think about this, our city honors and celebrates military veterans in many ways, especially on July the 4th. I think our July the 4th parade this past year set a bar so high and so good that you're going to really have to work this year just to bring that back or do better. But think how many veterans were involved and we had a hundred year old veteran in a special van in that parade. So let's be kind to them. Let's look for ways to make the day great for them, not something they start to dread 
when it gets to be night and it's close to the fireworks. There is just something fundamentally wrong with choosing to enjoy something that you know may be harmful to others. What I'd like to ask that we do, not, I'm not just grandstanding here, I have a plan of action. I want you to research using quiet fireworks. There's no such thing as silent fireworks. If there were, believe me, Disney would have discovered it. They're not silent, but they are quiet enough not to trigger PTSD, not to make people miserable. And if you could come back to this board, either next Thursday or at our first meeting in December, with information on what you found in your research that would be possible. I hope it's not too late for ordering fireworks for this year. I know you work on a, a very long timetable, but whatever we can do that truly celebrates all of our veterans, this is a good start. And that's what I'm asking you to do. Thank you. Is it okay if I speak to that? Or? Okay, so um, uh, thank you um, about the parade. Um, if y'all can get us some more bands, we'd be really appreciative. We're trying to get more bands. We've actually um, have someone that works on that. Um, but during the summer, it's a really hard time to get kids together um, to get them here. Um, and of course, there's a cost associated with that as far as, you know, accommodations and, and just overall gas and so on. Um, so uh, we are working on that, and thank you for that. It's, okay, so I have five horses, and it's really hot for them. Um, so with horses, um, I've got five of them, and uh, I have five too many, actually. And so, um, so the problem with the horses is it's just really hot. Um, when you put a wool blanket on their back and then you expect them to behave, um, and that can that can be a little bit much. And again, if there's any you know fire or a lot of these horses are what we call bomb proof, um, where they're used to being in parades and things like that, where they they'll tolerate those noises and people and balloons and um, things like that. Um, so. Horses, I would love to see more of them. Um, I know that they hang out under the trees and they don't saddle until the last minute, um, but it is usually quite hot for them. And then you've got a rider on your back, um, so it's, it's usually pretty hot for them. But thank you. I, I'd like to see more horses too. Exactly. I agree with that. Um, so just speaking um, to, to your point, um, my son's a veteran. My son-in-law is a veteran. Um, both um, are Marines. And um, I, I hear you um, with what your request is. I will do, I will do my research. Um, the biggest thing that we have as an obstacle is that we are a 501c3, and we are meeting this Thursday to go over all the financials. Um, and um, we, we hope to break even um, every year, and this will probably be one of those years. Um, so the expense of the fireworks comes into play. Um, I believe, and y'all can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's about approximately $42,000 between the barge and the fireworks for a 27-minute display. So it's very, a large portion of our budget goes toward the fireworks as, you know, the final entertainment to close out the 4th of July. Um, I, I think that one of the things that we could do is, and I'm not sure if it's on there, I'm thinking not, is that we could put a warning on our website too, to let those know that they are going to hear lar larger, louder fireworks. Um, but I have no problem at doing what you're asking me to. I think it would be good for all of us to, to hear about that. 
Um, but the last I knew, and again, I'm speaking from the past, is that in order to do a display like that, it would cost upward of $100,000 because these are special fireworks that have been generated for less noise. Um, but I do look forward to coming back to the board um, with this information so that we can, um, so that we can know the answers. Um, have you looked into um, applying for grants to help with that? Yes, absolutely. So I, part of my position within the 4th of July Festival is I have taken on the mantle of researching grants that uh, the festival is able to get in order to fund some of these things. Where we have not gone for a fireworks specific grant, I will let the board know just so we're fully aware, the festival is not yet a 501c3. It is still considered a 501c6 uh, because it was associated with the chamber for so long. We are still currently working on getting that designation switched. And therefore, it automatically out the gate disqualifies us from a lot of grants. So that is currently something that in my position I have been working on for the past two years and going into the third we'll continue to do. Uh, I do believe it's very possible that we can get 501c3. We have to have an education component and we, in my opinion, well meet that. Um, but there has been ideas that the board has also said to just kind of solidify that component. Um, I'd, I'd like to speak to the fireworks and um, PTSD. I am a uh, military spouse. I uh, went through years of um, deployments and uh, reintegration after deployments. Um, I think the fireworks are less of an issue than some of the other things that we have in town. I think that all of our veterans are well aware that fireworks come on 4th of July, and I don't think that that's a surprise regardless of the sound that those fireworks make. I think that our cannons going off unannounced is a much bigger trigger for our veterans in the area. Um, not that we don't want the cannon, just a warning that the cannon would go off. I think the fireworks are not a surprise. No one, no one thinks twice about the fireworks. Yes, it may be a trigger. However, it is a trigger that is a known um, and not a surprise to anyone. A cannon going off without having prior knowledge of that is absolutely a trigger and we have left events because of it. Thank you. Well, for cannon, that's not an issue anymore, so. Cannon was, was, was uh, the historical society decided they would never use it again. I love the cannon. The cannon's fantastic. It would be, be nice to have an announcement for the cannon. That was an issue in my other group. Um, I, I have
opportunity for some of those things to pass, which are filled on that yeah. which it may be in my of additional 50,000. I just offer for consideration that maybe some of that will be pushed to 2026 as opposed to spending the money in 2025. If the city's going to stop putting money away, want to work with the high school music directors and pay them because it's their, it's their son time, their own vacation time, and pay them to use their influence and the committee and the sponsors, the sponsor, rents the air conditioning buses to bring them here. How do we go about doing that? The bottom line is there's a lot of cost factors that we have no idea what those are. I suggest that we start looking at that now rather than next year to figure out what is that kind of So that's, that's my two cents for it. Robert, did you have a question? Yeah, I'm going to go back to Lowe's comments and I'll just say that I support her position. Um, I think that whatever decision would come down to price. So. Um, and you agree with that. I mean, it, yeah, so I, I like the idea. I just think that whatever it is, had, yeah. Any other questions from the board? The Fourth of July committee is on Thomas. We are not their boss. That's why I use the words that I use. Just suggestions and we will let it. Anything else? Mr. Mayor, if you will make a motion to approve the service agreement for this coming year. Uh, I will entertain a motion to do that, sir. Yes, sir. So, I will entertain a motion to uh, approve the service agreement for the
everybody I'm going to bring another Tom into the conversation um, so it's no longer T squared it'll be T to the third T to the third so um, how did we get here uh, back in February of 23 I started as part-time city engineer one of the things I was tasked with at that point was stormwater within the city getting the program going getting some ordinances into place and things like that. I'll tell the story again, as I've said hundreds of times, and people are probably sick of it. The first thing I asked on my first day is, show me the stormwater maps. And I was given maps from 1983 with no updates. So that's how everything started. At that point, I started looking into how we can get this uh, the system mapped. I found out about the Golden Leaf Grant Program and began preparing an application. That application was submitted in May of 2023 uh, to Golden Leaf for a stormwater mapping, modeling, and capital improvement plan. Because not only do we want the system mapped, but we want to have someone run, test things through it on a computer to see where choke points are and where we need improvements. And with that, then develop the capital improvement plan that we have for the system. So, and, it, and while this was going on, it was also the budget season, and the board at the time approved another $250,000 in the fiscal 2024 budget for stormwater improvements. In August of 23, we received notice the city was awarded $250,000 grant from Golden Leaf for the stormwater mapping, modeling, and capital improvement plan. In September 2023, we issued an RFQ, a request for qualifications for stormwater mapping, modeling, and capital improvement plan. And in October of 2023, the board awarded a contract to W.K. Dixon for the project with an October 2024 completion date. Um, and that completion date was also in our storm, in our grant from Golden Leaf uh, for the funding. In October of last year, we held a kickoff meeting with W.K. Dixon, and in October of this year, they completed the project and submitted the maps, which I have over there, and a nice short little report and all backup data and everything that's about 400 pages. Um, and that brings us to today, which um, W.K. Dixon will be presenting the report and the basis of how they did things and explanation of everything to the board. So with that, I will turn it over to the third Tom in the equation, Tom Murray from the Lee Davis. Thank you, Tom, and uh, good morning to the board. I appreciate uh, you having us here today. Um, we've enjoyed being able to work on this project uh, with the city and, and certainly appreciate our, uh, our relationship uh, over, uh, over the last several years. So the project has four, four main goals, as Tom alluded to. First and foremost was simply to, not simply, but to map and locate our stormwater features uh, within the city. Uh, as Tom noted, the previous uh, version uh, was from 1983 and not updated. So that was really the first step, and that's going to form really the backbone of your, of your stormwater program moving forward. Uh, the second goal uh, is the uh, condition assessment. Uh, to assess, uh, again, the, the current functionality uh, of the stormwater system and look for uh, ways that we can enhance our, our maintenance program uh, moving forward to extend the life of the system uh, as long as possible. Uh, the third uh, goal is the flood risk evaluation, uh, is to look at uh, duration of flooding, frequency of flooding, severity of flooding, location of those uh, repetitive uh, flood-prone areas, 
and then develop a capital improvement plan uh, that you can use moving forward uh, for budgeting and really ex uh, leveraging some of those external uh, funding sources. So why do we look at, why, why do we need a stormwater inventory? Why is mapping the stormwater system uh, important? Uh, in no particular order, number one is maintenance. Uh, for us to really proactively maintain the system, we have to know where it is. Uh, we have to know how it connects. Uh, we have to understand uh, what condition uh, the system is in so that we can start to move from a reactive uh, to proactive system. Uh, Having this database in GIS also allows us to overlay it with all of your other GIS layers, so it's very easy to see uh, what portion of the city is in city right away, what portion of the system is in DOT right away, and then what portion of the system is on private property, because that's going to impact how you maintain, how frequently you maintain, and the stakeholders that you need to involve for, for the long-term maintenance of your, of your program. It is a dynamic database. So no longer do we have paper maps. What we're able to do is when maintenance crews go out into the field, uh, they make a repair, uh, they uh, complete maintenance, unclog the system, they put that into the database, and that can feed a work order uh, management system so that if you realize that you're visiting the same location every month for a 12 month period of time, maybe we need to look at a more holistic solution. Uh, this also helps for uh, future planning, both for new development and, and redevelopment. We can understand where those developments tie into the stormwater infrastructure and make sure that new development and redevelopment isn't making an existing problem worse. We want to make sure that the system can, can handle uh, any additional runoff from those systems. Uh, and then we really need this, this data to begin the assessment of how do we reduce flood risk. Because again, we have to understand what we have in place first uh, as assets before we look at moving forward and, and understanding what additional infrastructure we need to have in place. So what is a stormwater inventory? Again, it is uh, a GIS database, a geodatabase. Uh, we have a digital location of each stormwater structure. Uh, that's the X and Y physical location. Where is it located? Uh, at the corner or is it on somebody's uh, backyard? Uh, and then uh, probably the most important feature of all of this is the connectivity. How does the system tie together so that we understand where it flows to, what it connects to, where it outfalls to. You're going to have systems that are private, public right away, back to private right away, or private property over to DOT infrastructure outletting to an open system. So we under need to understand how all that ties together. It's no longer just a line on the map. There's data behind uh, that's contained within that database. It's a wide range of attributes. So some of the most common ones that you're going to have in any stormwater inventory is the size of the infrastructure. Is it a 15-inch pipe? Is it a 36-inch pipe? What's the material? Is it a corrugated metal, metal pipe? Is it a concrete pipe? That's going to go back to how long we can expect that, uh, that asset to last, that you have different design lives. So a concrete pipe is typically going to last longer than a metal pipe, so that's an important information to have. Uh, the depth, we have elevation data on all of the stormwater infrastructure. So is it uh, very shallow, one foot of cover up to the roadway? Is it a pipe that's 10 feet deep? All of this is important, too, when you start looking at all the different other utilities that you have going through your roadway corridors. So how does the, we're now able to understand how the stormwater infrastructure relates back to your sanitary sewer infrastructure and your water infrastructure. And then we have photos associated with all of the assets. So that is very helpful for the maintenance crew. They can click on it. Obviously, we have a lot of uh, great information now just with Google Street View, but this is just another data point that the maintenance crew can say, hey, this is what the structure looks like. If I'm going out to main maintain this one location, I know is it is there grass surrounding it or do I need a, is it in concrete? Is it in asphalt? What equipment do I need to have uh, to serve this particular asset? That's going to make maintenance much more efficient because they don't have to go to location then go back to get the equipment, then go back to the location, so it can really streamline that process. 
And just uh, as a note, these map, these pictures here are the hard copy maps that you have of your current stormwater inventory uh, that are shown on the presentation. Now we move to what was actually uh, collected. And uh, the photo on the right uh, is, the, uh, is the geodatabase that was collected. Uh, the red lines are pipes. Uh, you can have arrows on there to show flow direction, so you can clearly see where, which direction the water is flowing. All of the blue points are uh, drainage features or drainage structures. Uh, so that could be your inlets, your manholes, or, or other sources. Uh, and then the blue dotted lines are open channels. So you can see in this one particular system uh, in, the, in the middle of the um, screen, uh, a lot of right-of-way uh, structures uh, draining over towards 211. Again, you're getting into the DOT right-of-way, then crossing back onto city streets, and then outletting to a uh, open channel that's gonna go through private property. Uh, as part of this effort, we collected over 900 uh, features, 900 drainage structures, again, manholes, drainage inlets, pipe outfalls, end of culverts, uh, and that, when you connected that system together, that's over 15 miles of drainage pipes with the wide ranges of sizes, from all the way down to eight inch pipe up to the larger uh, 96 inch uh, pipes, typically uh, as culvert crossings. Uh, the materials included concrete, metal, even plastic and clays. Uh, so clay pipes obviously is uh, typically very, very old as it's not, not used uh, currently. <laughs> pond structures as well. There's a number of wet detention, wet detention ponds, retention basins uh, within the city. So we uh, located those structures as well. And then we also completed uh, the connectivity for the open uh, the open system, the open streams and channels, because uh, when we get into evaluating and, and modeling the system, we have to have that information as well. So the next piece is, uh, is the condition assessment. And really, when we do the condition assessment, we look at two major factors. We look at the likelihood of failure of a particular asset, and we look at the consequence of failure of a particular asset. And then if you have a high likelihood and a high consequence, that's probably an asset that you want to take a closer look at uh, because it's really important and based off the data that we have, there's potential for, for failure there. And so this, this whole program is really meant to try to re rehabilitate or fix the system before it fails because it's always going to be more cost effective if you either can rehabilitate your system, extend the life, or go ahead and uh, make those repairs that are necessary before you have a sinkhole before you have a street closure that's going to have a water impact and, and be more costly. So some of the factors that fall into the likelihood of failure, number one is that visual inspection that we do during the inventory. So we can see, uh, is the structure starting to uh, cave in? Is there uh, a exposed rebar? Uh, is there a rusted pipe? Uh, some, of those, some of those elements are going to say, hey, this, this structure or pipe is, is nearing the end of its uh, useful life. We also look at material, as I noted before, and we try to estimate the age of the structure. That's not typical data that's easy to find, but we do have those maps from 1983, so we're able to say at least we know, hey, was this asset in the ground in 1983? If it is, you know, you're looking at getting on towards 40, 40 plus years and probably older than that. So that kind of helps us with age. Consequence is, is how much of an impact is the failure of the structure going to cause to your community? Uh, so typically, so for instance, if it's in, if it's a small pipe in somebody's backyard, obviously that's an impact to that property owner. But if it's a major uh, roadway crossing uh, within downtown, that's going to have a, a, a significant impact. And so we look at a variety of factors, you know, proximity to critical facilities such as uh, hospitals and schools. Uh, to, to evaluate what that consequence of, of failure would be. Uh, and then we're able to look at each of the assets, and the, the map on the screen is kind of a snapshot where the warmer colors, the reds and the oranges, are gonna be the areas that have a higher criticality and areas that you wanna take a closer look at. So what does that mean? What, what, is the, what is the next step? So for the highest criticality areas, one thing you can do is go ahead and CCTV uh, that pipe. And that allows you to see, uh, get a more in-depth view of the condition of that pipe. So if it's rusted out, if the bottom is starting to fail, 
you can go ahead and, and program in, again, uh, some ways to fix that pipe before it ultimately fails. Uh, so the CCTV inspection uh, is important. Again, it allows uh, being more proactive, and that's really what we're trying to do here is go from reactive uh, to proactive. So there's a lot of pipelining uh, products uh, available now that can extend the pipe life by 10, 20, 30 years if it's in general uh, a decent condition, if, it's, if there's enough deformity there where a lining scenario won't work, you can at least then program that repair into your budget instead of dealing with an emergency. So if you can go ahead and program it, you can get, you know, move any other utilities out of the way that you have to, much more efficient process than dealing with a, with a pipe failure. And I will say that's something that we're dealing with a lot throughout, you know, a lot of Flooding and, and, and news, you know, across the state, we're dealing with emergency sinkholes. We had one in Greenville, we have one in Raleigh, we have one in Burlington, we have one on the floor that closes out the whole street. You have to go find an emergency contractor to come out and talk about 24 7, trying to keep the community safe. And that's really what we're trying to avoid uh, here. It can happen, but this is one way to uh, kind of first step to being more uh, proactive in those, uh, in those ways. It also helps you coordinate with other key stakeholders. Obviously, you have several significant DOT roads uh, within, uh, within the city limits. Uh, when you do this analysis, you can at least kind of collaborate with DOT and be like, hey, this is, this is the data that we have. You know, and you can at least make, make the ask, can you go ahead and look at this uh, uh, system to see what your anticipated extended life uh, of that asset is? The next analysis that we completed is to evaluate uh, flood risk uh, within, uh, within the city. And that really looks at determining uh, the depth, duration, severity, and frequency of flooding. So we looked at a, uh, a series of rain events uh, from, uh, from the 50% likelihood storm or the two-year storm all the way up to the 100-year storm event, which is the 1% the uh, probability storm. Uh, we identified uh, at-risk infrastructure. So if you have a, uh, a two-year flooding event, what's the, what are the structures that are at risk versus if you have that 100-year event, what additional structures are going to be at risk uh, from, those, uh, from those different flooding events? And then also looked at identifying uh, systems and conveyance infrastructure uh, that will be undersized uh, for the different level, uh, different types of events. Can I ask you a question, sir? Absolutely. While we're still on the slide. Yes, sir. <clears throat> so, it, allegedly, the county is going to go to a hundred-year plan. That's what they, they've been talking about. So, if they do a hundred-year plan, and I, I'm assuming that means their system is going to be geared to take a greater volume of water than a 10-year plan, am I correct in that question? You may have to walk up here, I'm sorry. I'm only asking because we're on this, this page here. So. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Let you go, uh, jump in. I'm not sure what they mean by a 100-year plan. Are they looking at something for 100 years of development, or are they looking for each, for a for each new development? Storm? Each new development <laughs> they're claiming. I believe it's the 100-year storm. The 100-year storm. The 100 year storm. Right I'm sorry. Only at I mean, I, I, my, my, bad. my bad. It's, she's correct. It's a 100-year storm. Okay. So their developments in the future may be that number. I don't think they voted on it yet. They haven't voted on anything yet. But um, if, if that's the case, on those areas that we talked about, where water is coming from the what well, used to be the ETJ and interacting with our water because it has to get past us to get to there. Um, does that change the plan? If there if the new developments have a hundred year storm rating and they're pushing that much water out to us, how, how, is that going to impact anything that you've done, sir? It it, it, sh it should um, because of. of with the when, when they're designing for the hundred year storm, what they're doing is they're having the existing area release no more water from the hundred year storm as it did pre development, post development. So the amount of water getting into the system should theoretically be the same for that storm. 
if they're addressing it with the 100-year storm. That's in a nutshell. Yes, it, it always is in it. Um, the other part of this is, though, that although the detention basins may be designed for the 100-year storm, generally the piping systems are not designed for the 100-year storm. They're designed more for the 10- and 25-year storm. So, well, I guess my, my, that leads to my question is just that the piping that you have, rec I've seen it where you have, a re you have 11, I'm going to use the word choke points, I don't know what's the technical term for it, and you have piping right down to how many linear feet of X. Is that, for what size dorm would that be? So that, that piping uh, is typically we do a 10-year storm for the closed pipe system, and then we do a 25-year storm at like uh, at uh, road crossings where you have an open stream going to the road crossing. But what they mean, again, like Tom said, what they mean for the 100-year storm is really looking at how much you're going to detain. Okay. So when that site is developed, right now when you have a 100-year storm on an on undeveloped site, you're going to have a certain amount of runoff from that storm. They're saying when the future development comes in, you have to put measures in place so that you do not exceed the amount of water coming off of your property uh, from the 100-year storm uh, when you go ahead and put that pervious area in. So basically what, what that ultimately looks like is the detention ponds for that new development are going to be larger. We have on a Tuesday afternoon in the summertime much more than a 10-year storm based on the charts that we have. So I'm just trying to figure out down the road that when we start to invest into this money, are, are we looking for the right size piping to take the ever increasing water that may come to us? And I think that's always, that, that is a decision that, that you can look at is what level of service you're trying to provide. So the, again, the standard level of service for closed pipes would be, would be 10 year. You can look at expanding that. Can you, can you, for the purposes of this board and for the audience, tell me how many inches of rain and how much time is a 10-year storm? Sure. It, it varies uh, across the state. So the, coast, uh, the, the uh, depths of rainfall are typically a little bit greater. Uh, so the 10-year storm in this location is usually about 6 or 7 inches over a 24-hour period of time. That's why I meant that we get that on a, we get that on a Tuesday afternoon. Yeah. Um, so, so, so it, your your bill, the, the, the estimated cost, and I, and I trust me, I thought this was a fantastic document that you guys supplied. There's actually four components to it, as I understand it. You did the mapping, mm -hmm. you did the choke points, you did how do you fix the choke points? I, I suggested how you do the setup, and you identified grants. Just a wonderful product. But I want to make sure that we're, when, when we and that, at that, I think it was 26 million. Estimated? Probably. Like that. Uh, 29. Yeah. 29? 29, man, I'm sorry. Um, to, to fix just those 11 choke points. Um, and so if we, if we were to somehow, over the course of years, get that money, is the piping and other things that are there really going to, should they be enhanced? We'll slow the whole process down, I understand that. I'm assuming you start at the water side and work your way up so that you don't flood new places if we allow more water to go from the top end to the bottom end. Um, but that's that's what I've been a quandary because I'm not an expert in this at all. Sure. But I just want to make sure that if we're going to spend tens of millions of dollars, let's look at what we really have and we have six to eight inches of rain amazingly here, most of it goes away pretty quickly, um, without even having a, a name attached to it, just a storm. Sure, sure. It's certainly evaluating what your desired level of service and extent of service is, is something that you can do. Of course, there's always gonna be a cost benefit of that, but what you can do when you go into a particular project, because the next phase is gonna take a project and say, okay, we wanna move forward and look for grant funds. When you look at uh, grant funding and then moving into design and permitting, you can look for areas where you can gain a little bit of additional capacity and try to balance that cost curve. Where can we do that uh, while staying as cost effective as, as possible? 
There's going to be a couple areas. Sometimes you're just going to be constrained by your physical limitations. So you're at the coast, you have flat slopes, you have limited cover on the streets. Sometimes there's only so much water that you can put in the pipe and, and put in the stream. But when you move into that design, you can look to say, you know, if we're recommending a 36 inch pipe, but a 48 inch pipe isn't going to make that much of a difference from a cost perspective and it's going to give us a greater level of service. You can start to make some of those changes as you move into design. You may not be able to get a 25 or 50 year level of service for the entire system. Uh, just because the cost, again, is going to escalate to a, to a certain amount. The other component, and I'm glad you tied in the, the grant funding, but when you start to look at some of, for instance, the FEMA funds that are available, the FEMA BRIC funding, there's a hard requirement to make sure that the benefit-cost ratio is greater than one. So as you're applying for those grants and as you're going through design, you can look at, okay, is the additional, if we can go to that additional 25 years old level of service, does that benefit really offset the increased cost? Because we need to make sure that we keep that benefit cost ratio greater than one to be able to apply uh, for those different, different grants. So I think on a project by project basis, you, you can certainly make some of those changes. Uh, if you wanted to go to, for instance, uh, looking at your new development uh, community and the design standards that you have for them. That's a, that's a little bit greater discussion to think about, hey, do you want to change your design standard for the development community? Uh, and so th that, that is something that can certainly be looked at. Um, but again, the industry standard for closed pipe systems is usually going to be around that 10 to 25 year event. Okay, and then we have the, and I don't want to skip line of thunder, but uh, we have the, the of the potential FEMA remediation program, but I guess you guys have already done some filming on that. Will be in the coming weeks. Okay. <clears throat> All right, I'll, I'll let Ryan talk about his, his thunder. Um, but but those, those are great questions, and when you look at flooding, we're always looking at uh, reducing risk. Uh, you, cannot, uh, you cannot always eliminate flooding everywhere. But um, you might have, okay, you have a 10-year level of service, uh, for, but when a 25-year storm hits, maybe you have an inch of flooding in the roadway instead of six inches of flooding in the roadway. And what that means is that you can still get traffic uh, that can drive through an inch of water versus having enough water that closes down the street. Uh, and making sure that you have resilient infrastructure so that if you have, you're always, there's always gonna be a bigger storm. You guys are very well aware of that. And so when you have a bigger storm, we want to make sure that the infrastructure uh, can withstand that and, and not be damaged, even if it is higher than, than what its capacity is. Uh, so again, we really focus on uh, risk reduction and trying to thread that benefit cost needle as, as, as best as possible. So we did develop uh, planning level conceptual solutions for 11 systems uh, within, uh, within the city limits. Uh, we met with town, our city staff uh, early on in the project to look at some of the areas that have had repetitive flooding in the past uh, to make sure that we focused on those critical areas. We also used the inventory data to uh, flag areas where we thought might be flood prone. So for instance, there are bottlenecks in the system where you might have a 36 inch pipe, goes down to a 24 inch pipe, goes back to a 36 inch pipe. We can be fairly confident that that 24 inch pipe might cause a problem, we might have flooding there. So we looked at some of those areas uh, as well, uh, the choke points, uh, if, if you will. So we have a wide range of solutions uh, for the types of projects they're typically gonna include. Sometimes we just need larger infrastructure, right? I mean, a lot of the infrastructure was put in place many years ago. Uh, I think I calculated over 30,000 uh, linear feet of pipe or 15 inches or smaller. A 12 inch or 15 inch pipe typically isn't uh, really going to have the capacity uh, that you need uh, in your system. It's also more likely to get clogged with debris. So a 12 inch pipe, very easy to get clogged and, and back up water. Uh, many times down on the coast, we have a lot of issues with flat pipes or even negative slope pipes. So we're able to flag those pipes and, and look for ways to where we can get even maybe even a half percent slope will make a big difference in the ability to, to convey uh, to convey runoff. Do they, do they ever use the, the same thing we do with the sewage that we add pressure to it to push it, 
approach it further down on the where we have limited slope? There, there are stormwater like lift station. I guess is the word I'm looking for. There are stormwater pump stations. Uh, for this phase of the study, we didn't look at those because they are very costly, not only to construct, but the maintenance is really kind of the one of the, the big issues. But if you look at Hilton Head, for instance, they have pump stations everywhere. Now they have a huge tidal fluctuation. I think it's almost like a nine nine foot tidal fluctuation in their system. Uh, so again, every system is a little bit different. Atlantic Beach has some very uh, small pump stations uh, along Fort Macon Road. Uh, that pump water to the dunes and allows the water to just kind of soak into the dunes, but those are only activated during uh, during during flood events. So uh, there's a there's a wide range there uh, of what you can do. What we tried to do with this study is look at look to see how we could use gravity to the extent possible, um, and, and I think we were able to do that in most cases. Uh, in some areas, we simply needed to add infrastructure where there is no infrastructure. You're going to have areas where you don't have any catch basins, you don't have curb and gutter, you don't even have roadside uh, ditches. So there were areas where uh, we recommended adding infrastructure where there's no infrastructure in place. And then the last piece was looking at, uh, in some areas, rerouting uh, infrastructure uh, back to the public right away. So one great thing about this database now that you can overlay with all of your other layers and you can start to see, you bring in your aerial photography and you can see, okay, we have a pipe under a building at different locations. And so where we can reroute water um, and, and back to the right of way, and then we can abandon that pipe under a private structure, will eliminate a long-term headache uh, for everybody. And that would be like at the hospital. Don't we have an underground ground? Yes. Correct. Correct. Okay. So you reroute that back to the right of way, you can fill that existing pipe with grout, abandon it, and then you don't have to worry about it uh, anymore. So, so have you seen some of our uh, plumbing or, or drainage work on Bonnet Street? Bonnet Street is one of our, uh, one of our large uh, project areas, correct. How do you like how we put a sewer line through the middle of a drain system? That, uh, we have seen it before, uh, it's, it's, it's not ideal, and whenever we go into the design of these projects, we do try to uh, eliminate uh, utility conflicts uh, to the extent possible. Um, so a lot of these infrastructure projects do turn, that, and that's part of what drives the cost that we try to incorporate, is you're not only talking about the cost of putting a storm pipe in the, in the ground. You put in a bigger storm pipe, you gotta move the sanitary pipe, you gotta move the water line, you got to deal with your dry utilities as well. So it can become larger, larger infrastructure projects. So we've blown out, not quite this last storm because of what, what the duration, but it was overrun and then it backed up. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think Mayor Alden alluded to it. We start, we need to start at the river first because if we improve up the line, it's going to overwhelm us yep. where that bonnet creek and so I am one for building a bridge there rather than a culvert because I don't think you can address that sewer line any other way. It's always going to run through the culvert mm -hmm. unless you build a bridge. Yeah. And that seems to be a very dangerous thing that if the pressure, would, it was almost like a pressure washer, that it was a, might have been a 40-inch pipe with 24 inches blocked mm -hmm. coming out. So uh, that was a very dangerous situation. I just don't see how we can put a culvert back there. Yeah. But yeah, you're, you're correct. And dealing with all of the utility conflicts uh, is, is a challenge. And working from downstream to upstream is very important. And that's part of what, when we look at these systems, we look at them from a, a systematic, uh, per, uh, holistic perspective, watershed-based approach because we don't want to open up a pipe system and cause a problem for somebody downstream. Uh, and that's where you kind of see some of the size of these projects is to make sure that we look holistically uh, at the entire system and we don't just move a problem 200 feet downstream uh, and cause a problem somewhere else. Do you? Do, I'm sure you've done topographical mapping so that you know which direction the water sheds in most areas. Correct. Right, and that helps you, and that helps you determine where to route the water. Correct. And so I've seen you've got, you've got several things uh, like Park Avenue Extension where you're routing it to that Prices Creek area. Mm -hmm. And then we have that. So how many key drainage 
I'm, I grew up here and I have my opinion, but how many drainage locations do we have? Do you, could you answer that question? As far as number of watersheds or yeah. number of outfalls? Yeah, what, what do you see? How many do you see is just crucial to maintain? Well, I mean, as far as, well, we broke this into 11 uh, systems, but you have probably four or five, like, large, large watersheds. So some of our systems, we might have multiple projects within, uh, within one watershed, uh, depending on how it is. But one of the things that I think is so important about the inventory data, uh, especially in coastal areas, is that we did get uh, invert elevations on all of the pipes so that we're able to see where it drains. Uh, because, because sometimes the pipe system will actually go in the opposite direction of where overland flow you, you know, may take it just from the overland topographical data. So we do have that data now to be able to see how it connects. And if we need to make some changes, usually you don't want to send a lot of water from one watershed to a different uh, one, but there, there can be times at the upper edge of the system where it might make more sense to connect uh, in the other direction than how it's currently connected. So we can make those types of analyses as well. I think one of the greatest drains that we have that we don't use is the Duke Canal. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we can use that or not. But, and that's the road, the bridges that you cross, that come in. Uh, and, and, and this is another subject that I need to make while I've got a hold of it in my mind. We didn't look at river mist and do any kind of analysis of river mist, which is on the other side of the canal. No, we didn't as far as it was in the city limits. Correct. Yeah, we didn't look at it. Okay, and, and, and uh, so we do need to continue to look at their solutions, which are completely different because we have that canal in between us. Their, uh, their stormwater drain is completely different than ours. Right, and we did not include that in this because we had up-to-date maps on river mist. Um, a lot of the issues in River Mist, uh, from what I understand and speaking with residents up there, is they've had two floods in the past six years. Um, Florence and in September at TPC-8. Um, one of the issues that they have, the big issue they have there is the top elevation of their detention basin is higher than some of their storm grates. So when that basin fills up with water, it's going to back up through their storm system. And that's what the issue was, was up there on two storms in six years. Do we, do we own, we the city, own their storm system? We, their storm system is within the roadway. We are, that's township, uh, city right of way. Okay. Uh, we do not maintain or own the detention basins. That is their responsibility. They have state DEQ permits for maintaining them. And the issue with the storm system up there is not the drains in the road, it's the detention basins themselves are not geared for storms in excess of 100 years. I, have, I asked two questions. I only got the answer to one, but just so you know. The first question you just answered, which you I did not get, which is, do we own it? Uh, and you explain which parts of which we do own. Um, and the second question is, why, again, explain to me again, why did we not study it? Because we had maps we had that were within okay. we knew it 10, going. 15 years old. Okay. So the, the issue that you observed there, this is a big, I understand that the, the two storms that they're talking about, probably no system would ever hold it all anyway. Correct. And we have to, keep reminding people of that issue. But if they were to fix a piece of it to allow the to be this you know this way as opposed to this way, would that help? Is it is In there a cost storms they still would have had flooding regardless. Right, but it would is there a cost benefit analysis to, 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 that we can do or help them understand what they need to do to say that if you did this the benefit would, would all, let's assume it's not going to be big, it would only be this much and the cost would be this much, then you guys have to figure that out. Well, the detention basins are their responsibility, so why would the city get involved in analyzing their detention basins if it's not city maintained? Do we own any retention basins? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. So I believe the, they're all the, the standard HOA, HOA that owns them. Correct. Okay. 
I was not familiar with that. So uh, getting close to wrapping up here, just looking at uh, an example of uh, what some of the recommendations would be. Um, again, this is at a conceptual level, but what we look at is the proposed size and extent of the infrastructure uh, replacement. So are we looking at 300 feet of infrastructure or are we looking at 2,000 feet of infrastructure? And then what's the approximate size? Again, this is intended for planning purposes uh, to move forward into the, the next step uh, next steps in the process. Uh, we then evaluate some of the other costs that we talked about, such as potential utility conflicts, uh, asphalt replacement, sidewalk replacement, yard repair, curb and gutter, whatever that may be. We don't know what all of those are going to be exactly right now until we design the project, but we want to go ahead and put in some line items and estimated costs uh, for those so that we're looking at a total project cost and not just the cost of uh, putting, uh, putting the pipe in the ground. We then look at prioritizing uh, these projects, which I'll talk about in more detail uh, in just the next slide. Want to make sure that we're coordinating with the maintenance plan. So if, if we identify a pipe in the maintenance plan that needs to be replaced, and we say, okay, it's a 24 inch pipe, it may be also in these flooding areas, and so you can go ahead and replace it with a larger pipe, if that makes sense. So before you really have the money or the funds to go with the full capital replacement plan, you want to make sure that you're coordinating your maintenance plan with your uh, with your capital plan. Uh, and then again, we've talked about alluded it already, but really uh, these studies are critical for supporting uh, future funding applications because wherever you ask for funding from, they want this level of information. It's like, well, what's the scale of your project? What's the scope of your project? What's going to be the benefit of the project? And of course, what's the potential or estimated cost of uh, the project? Uh, as I mentioned, for uh, some of the FEMA BRIC grants, you have to go through that uh, benefit cost analysis. Uh, Golden Leaf, which funded the study, would like to go ahead and, and continue investing in, in communities where they've already committed some of that investment, but you need to have this information before you can go ahead and ask for money for construction, because they're going to ask where, how much, you know, who are you benefiting? So that's a, a really important component uh, of these types of projects. So then the final piece was looking at trying to have some quantified way of prioritizing uh, your projects. So we look at a, a wide variety of factors. We try to focus on, you know, for flooding, obviously we want to focus on public health and safety. We want to focus on street flooding and look at the type of improve or the amount of improvement that we can provide uh, from, these, uh, from these different projects. And then there's going to be other elements that folk that come into constructability, and that might be permitting. It might be uh, working with DOT. It might be working with private property owners and starting to think about how all of those other factors uh, play into, into how, not how easy it is to implement a project, but, but thinking through all of the different uh, barriers that, that might be there for implementing a project. Uh, and then we came up with the 11 uh, projects, uh, the prioritization uh, list uh, shown in the presentation and in the report. Uh, now I've talked to Tom already, but there are uh, opportunities to phase the projects. So it's not that you necessarily have to bite off that entire amount. Uh, as we've talked about, it often makes sense to work from downstream to upstream, but you could break the Bonnets Creek project into four phases uh, and, and, and fund and implement those as you have funding uh, or as you're able to procure uh, and, and, and really see what type of grant funding you can get. If you get $2 million, maybe you do $2 million uh, worth of work and you have to start phasing these types of projects. And that really comes down to financing both internally and, and, and through external sources. Uh, but with that, uh, certainly uh, enjoy the questions along the way, but I'd be happy to entertain uh, any additional questions uh, that you have. I, I do have a couple of questions. On the number one one is the Fodell. <laughs> And on your mapping, number one priority set. I'm assuming that means it's the most, the one we should take, kind of shoot for first. Um, and so for the Fodell, if I, if I read the mapping correctly, there's a, a, there's a recommendation of putting piping in through private property, is there not? I believe so. Okay. Yes. Right. So what, the question I have for the manager is, do we have the documents ready 
to do the easements for for the storm water program. Okay. Yeah, for this particular project, actually, it's all in the right of way, but um, uh, for the North Feldale system. Uh, but in general, typically we would do the easements as part of the design process and, and any easements that would be required, we would go ahead and, and do during design and permitting. This next statement has nothing to do with you, okay? Okay, no worries. We are at standstill for the shoreline restoration for easements or right of ways, which where that word, word is the most appropriate one like six lots not one permit is going forward because we cannot get the language done so my thing is for all these other projects we we have to we have to get this language done beforehand because the whole thing stopped because we don't have the language to put into the application to move it forward and that is just mind-boggling to me because I've talked about this for three years about we have to get the language, we have to get the language, we have to get the language. Finally, we get the, the report, the, the mechanical part of it done, and that was what I was told had was the hold up, and then we still don't have the language as of today. So we got, we got a year and a half to spend $5 million, but we have to give it back. And the rate we're going now, I have no idea if we're ever going to make that. So this is a big deal to me, is that whatever easements, whatever thing we need to do to do these projects, we have to have the words on a piece of paper ready to go to landowners as soon as we can. So that is the holdup for doing it. And once again, I'm not, my, my frustration is not certainly not geared to you because I, I think you've done a wonderful project. Let, let me just add one thing. With, with these projects, it's hard to go out and get an easement until we actually have a design laid out. These are just conceptuals that are here on paper. We couldn't go for easements based on conceptual designs um, because you need the actual area that you're going to, I don't want to say take from people, but use from someone. Um, so until we you know, say, let's get this thing designed and we start that design, that's when we can start going for easements on these projects. Just want to say, we had one of the six people in the room earlier, mm -hmm. and I did speak with her, and she said that Tom Z has, done, has already approached her about the easements on the, on the shoreline stabilization, so he is doing his part. Um, and she, she had a piece of paper? <coughs> but she, she was very aware, and she, she knows who to talk to, and, and things look good. Yeah. Mark, just let me correct you, because... Tom Z isn't handling the shoreline stabilization. That's Bob J. Okay. I, I, I know I'm her favorite, but. She asked me. She, I said, the guy in the blue shirt, Mr. Berla. So, uh, okay, I'm sorry. I, no. uh, she did say she was had been approached already. And that was a major concern of mine as well. So, um, so let me, I'm going to change over to the Fodale thing, uh, the Fodale uh, project. There's a ditch in the back of people's property. Okay, and it's shared by two sides, two roads. Um, and they're considering putting a pipe to fix the flooding that has historically been there. These pipes only have a few entry points. So my question is, what moves water better? A pipe with three or four entry points or ditches with multiple entry points? More often than not, a channel will can convey will typically convey more than than a pipe, more water, and, and to your point, it has more more entry points. There are scenarios uh, where it makes sense uh, to put in a pipe, but um, you know there's there's pros and cons uh, to both approaches. Um, you also have to always look at the permitting implications when you pipe in a, a channel, whether it's a channel or a stream, it makes a big difference on what you're allowed to do and, and how much it's gonna cost from the regulatory uh, side of things. Um, but going back to the easements really quick, the, the typical process we see moving forward for these types of projects is when you decide to move forward with a project, you know, number one is how are we gonna fund it? So if you're gonna, if you wanna fund it externally through grants, you go through the grant process, what you have now is typically what you need to go ahead and, and pursue uh, pursue funding. 
once you decide to, you have the funding in place, whether it's internal or external, you would start the design and permitting process. Because you're going to have to get a design level survey. So everything that we're dealing with, it's good elevation data, it's good information, but you really need a full design level survey that has all of the utilities and it has all of the property boundaries. You know, GIS parcel lines are not the same as a design survey. You know, you obviously all know that. So when we get that information, usually we start to look at easements about the 70, what we call 70% design. That's where we have everything laid out. We know where it's going to be. We know what's going to work. We know what level of service. We know the utility conflicts, where everything's going to be. And that's the point where usually we start easements. So easements and permitting really go from 70% to 100%. Well, I guess the flip side of that is that these ditches are already used to move city water from point A to point B. Somewhere, and now I'm only relying on oral history, because as Tom Z. saw, our maps are 1983, and our record keeping is less than stellar. So somebody put those ditches in there. There's no stream headwaters. Somebody put those ditches in there because you just look down the line. At some point, according to the people who all live there, the city was, in fact, keeping the ditches clean. And then at some point, the city decided not to do that any longer. Now we come back, and we don't have any easements even to clean the ditches. So we don't clean the ditches. I don't know if cleaning those ditches would help as we look through the multi-year study down the road. But what I think we're looking at it is, this is a path. Right here is a path. Multi-year, could be decades, by the time you get it all done. And then we have today. And should and so I, I'm curious if this should be a policy decision by this board, and that would be a manager issue. Should this be a policy issue brought forth to us in the relatively near future, and in which we look at easements in order to incur the cost? I realize that, but it's moving our water, and that's do, do we do we do that now so we can keep them what as much water as we can moving downstream? So that's another easement issue that I have because we've stopped altogether. I recall, I believe it was maybe six or seven years ago, I think post uh, Florence, uh, hearing from Public Works that there are a number of property owners that did not willingly allow anybody from Public Works onto their property to clear out the ditches. And we had no apparatus, no method of being able to go in and do that if they said no. Well, that may be true. But that's the same story, fairy tale lines that I get as well. I think I think at some point the city dug, dug these ditches. I think I think the city uh, used to clean them. We don't we don't have any paperwork. And until we go and make a decision, do we want to do this? this? Is a board decision. And then we go and actually knock on doors. And here's a piece of paper. And we'd like to get. We have no idea how big or small that problem problem is. And we need to figure out. The first issue is, do we take on that, I'm not asking you to do this today, do we take on that role of keeping these ditches, because if, if they were to block it right now, or it got blocked, let's just say it got blocked without an individual doing it, where would all that water go to? And it, it's getting clogged up. How are we even allowed a little freaking culvert this big to be allowed between this guy's property and this guy's property because they're family members and they want to drive their golf carts right on the top of it. That's an issue as well. That kind of thing happened because there's no regulation in the town, in the city court. So it starts with getting regulations in place. Um, you know, when someone wants to put a culvert between two properties to, you know, so they can cross at each other, Neither one of them are hydraulic engineers, so they don't know how to design the proper thing there. It's going in without the city's knowledge. It, 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 it starts somewhere, you know. So, so you're right. Now we're trying to.
fix things 20, 30, 50 years down the line, um, that wasn't part of this study. This study was to map the system and look for choke points and come up with a capital improvement plan to fix those ch choke points. That's what this study was about. I tend to think, I, I understand exactly the, the nuance of what you're saying here, but then we have the greater population that wants us to do it all tomorrow and we can't do it all tomorrow. So what can we do today reasonably to move forward? It's not A or B. It's not, oh, we're going to do that or, and we're not going to do this. That's a silly way of looking at it. It is, what can we do to subject as we wait to do this? Because this is money, big money. Um, and so if we have to change the UDO to, to allow us to be able to do that in the future, prevent that in the future, let's move forward with it and stop yakking and clacking back. And that's, That's exactly what I want you to do. And you are doing that. And we yeah. are doing that. Um, Bo and I have been working on this for quite a few months now. Um, we had it tabled, um, and now it's coming back, and we're trying to set up getting before the planning board on these things with it. That's a total separate thing from this. They're both under the same umbrella, but they're two different things. One is an infrastructure thing. One is a regulation thing for development that comes into town. Um, both of those go together to solve the issue and reduce the impact during rain. Well, I hope during these conversations with, with Mo and the planning board and stuff, if, if, if that's the direction it has to go, then that's the direction it has to go. That the topic of do we take over these, do we have easements for these privately, ditches on private property, so that I would tend to think that's a policy issue. It, I think that's what we would do. It, right. For any existing ditch that runs on private property, which now thanks to the mapping um, and that. the GIS model, we can pull these up uh, and find them very easily. That would not be part of anything that Mo and I are working on. That's a policy decision for this board to make with advice from council. Yeah. I'm going to have that put on the November 14th agenda to, move, to have that discussion with this board to see where we're going to go. And I, but I think part of that, and I, don't, I don't know about how we progress, but part of that would be having Tom tell us a, a prioritization with that. What does that all mean? That, I do not believe I will be able to have that done by November 14th because I'm heading out of town on Friday and I won't be coming back on the 14th. I, I, don't, I, don't, I would <laughs> never expect you to have it done. In other words, what I'm asking for, it, does the board want to have to move forward with the process of, of doing the easements? In other words, are we going to direct the manager to go do that because it's a policy issue? And then he comes back and says, this is the issues that we have. This is what you need to consider. This is everything that's there. The good, the bad, the ugly, all of that. And then we move forward with it. None of that's going to be decided on the 14th. I'm just looking for the, to have a motion to direct the manager to, to do that kind of work. I think first we need the, to hear from the attorney because as we know from the past, there will be people, private property owners, who will be very aggrieved at the idea of giving the city an easement and we'll probably say no. So what do we do? What can that's, we that's do legally? That's one little spigeon of the whole thing. The question is, it's a philosophical thing to ask. I'm at, we're not gonna have all the answers on the 14th of November. I'm asking that on the 14th of November that the board consider directing the manager to move forward with doing that look at and see what the cost is, what the legal is, what all of that is, and we start looking at that because if we can, if, if cleaning those ditches will alleviate some of our problems, then why, why am I waiting for three years down the line to, to, to get a pipe in? There, I think there are a couple, I think there are a couple of conversations, and I'm not sure I'm keeping up, because uh, part of this is as it relates to uh, 
having language that would allow us to enforce these guidelines with regards to the storm order ditches, correct? Like part of it is us having something to enforce. Right now, I'm going to say 90 to 95 percent of these ditches are on private property. A lot of them are at the end of the run between the last, I'll call it catch basin, and the creek or the river. There's one or two that I'm aware of that are in the middle of the system. We're sort of accepting the way it has been done. We have easements on the fronts of those properties. We don't have to go to the ditch. We have the easement on the road of Fodale. The problem is we're going into people's backyards and then we'll have to maintain those easements in people's backyards rather than having the easements already in place. Those ditches only help the people on that side of the road. The people on the other side of Fodale Road, they don't get any benefit. They're not getting necessarily the benefit of that. So why can't we put route those drain lines on our easements on the road? If we're looking at just doing ditches, then we can't have open ditches running alongside all of our roads. These are hidden in their backyard. You would never see them unless you went to their home. And they could continue to be there of their own volition. But we put our drain systems where we own. And why do we want to go and own more when we already have the easements on the fronts of those properties? Well, we're not going to own anything. And I've had this conversation about the whole question you had. If I put a pipe there, I've got to punch a thousand holes into it. Or I leave a ditch and it all just drains naturally into it. I'm looking at the ditches as the in-between step before we get enough money to run a pipe down Fodale. To do that is going to be millions of dollars, and we don't have millions of dollars. So I'm looking to figure out what do we do between now and then? Do we do nothing, which is what we've been doing? Or do we do something? I don't know what the doing is going to cost. I don't know what the legal ramifications are, except people telling me who have about as much knowledge as I do, which is zero, tell me what it's going to be. So I'd like to have the city do a study to do that kind of work and tell us the pros and cons. If it's really going to be super expensive, then we may decide not to do it at all. If we have someone that has a pipe or whatever in their backyard, is that causing flooding? Is that causing a problem for them now? And if it is, why wouldn't they be amenable for us going in and help fix that? Well, you raised a question, Frank. We have lots of people. We have storylines and people talking in bars and every place else about I'm not going to do it. They may. At the end of the day, we go down and we talk to 100 people, and two people say no. Then we have to decide what we're going to do about the whole thing. But until we go and really – I can't imagine why you would say no if your house keeps getting flooded. I can't imagine. But maybe they like it. I don't know. But getting a more efficient system on FODEL as best we can in the meantime, as well as other places. I'm just using FODEL as an example. Is that the best means for this long-term project? I think it's certainly more cost-effective to clean out ditches that are already there than to dig new ditches. And if the cost is in the paperwork to do the easements for us to have access and in dealing with Brady to be able to do that, then let's figure out what the cost is per 100 yards or I don't know what the linear footage of ditches. What's the cost per linear foot to keep that clean versus if we're looking at $29 million, we don't have $29 million right now, but we might have $15,000 to clean out ditches that are already there. Most of these ditches weren't built for drainage. They were more than likely fire ditches. 
more than likely, behind Cape Fear Drive and that, that area, tons of fire ditches that were designed and then the water flowed there. So it's not necessarily the perfect place. It's just something that happened and we can't use it. Uh, Mayor, I, I don't have a problem beginning that study now. In fact, I'm talking to my staff about those ditches. I can begin that study. I hear enough interest. I don't <clears throat> Is there any reason to not? I'm good with that, sir. I'm sorry to take up your time with my rants. I apologize. Sir. Okay. Any other questions for the, these two gentlemen? Not hearing any. Really? Do you have more to go? Yeah. Well, there's, go. there's one more slide to go for. <laughs> Where do we go from here? Um, the study and CIP plan will be used as background data for grant and submissions, as Tom explained. Um, last week, I submitted a letter of intent for the an NC DPS building resilient infrastructure.